Hello everyone and welcome to EBPF Summit 2023. I've got to say Duffy and I were both nodding along to that music, it's great. So my name is Liz Rice, I am Chief Open Source Officer at ISOVALEN. I'm very excited about today and I'm delighted to be hosting again alongside my friend and colleague Duffy Cooley. Hey everybody, I'm Duffy Cooley, I'm the Field CTO at ISOVALEN. We've got a really exciting lineup of speakers for you today. Um, and even a few surprises for this year's uh, EBPF Summit. Can you believe it's already the fourth edition? I know, right? So if we can bring up the slides, please. Now, I think if you're watching live, you already found our video stream, but here is the, the link to YouTube, so you can share that to your friends on social media. You might be watching us on YouTube. We are also streaming to Twitch and LinkedIn and a few other sites, so welcome to you wherever you're watching from. You can see our schedule online at ebpf.io slash summit 2023 dash schedule. Um, that's also where you'll be where, where we'll be posting the slides and links to videos after the event. This could take a few days, but you'll be able to see all of those things. We would also love it if you join us on Slack today. We can see already lots of folks joining and saying hi. It's, it's fantastic to see so many people joining us there. Um, so follow that link if you're not already in the Slack. That's also where we will be hosting all the Q&A today. We really hope you'll meet and discuss with other folks attending the conference today. Please go ahead and say hello in that hash EBPF Summit channel. All right. Uh, so like every year, we are thrilled that there are so many of you from around the world, and we want to make sure that all of you have a great experience. So we do have a code of conduct. I encourage you to take a look. But the main point is we expect you to behave respectfully today, be human and be kind. If anyone does find they are having any issues related to the code of conduct, please reach out to either Bill Mulligan or Cornelia Hertzman in the Slack channel, uh, or you can email us at summit at ebpf.io. 
And of course, no conference would be complete without a little bit of swag. You can download a, a Zoom background for free on our eBPF store. Where And we will also have a store where you can buy some of stickers, bags, and t-shirts. <clears throat> we also have tons of great learning resources. In fact, we just added some new ones to eBPF.io. You can see the new labs. If you go to eBPF.io, you'll be able to see new labs that will actually take you through getting uh, getting started with eBPF and how to like create your very first eBPF program. Um, and those are available to you on eBPF.io, so definitely check those out. You'll also find fantastic books that you can download for free, and you'll find links to some just, you know, all of the amazing work that our, our colleagues have put in. So definitely check that out. So I've seen the Slack comments coming through. We can see people from all around the world. I do hope we've got some French-speaking viewers. Bonjour, bonsoir et bienvenue. Uh, if you go to the ebpf.io homepage and look in the top right hand corner, you'll find a new drop down where you can select a language. And we're really pleased that we now have our first live translation. It is in French. We would love to host some more languages. So if you're interested in helping with other translations of ebpf.io, please reach out to our community pollinator, Bill Mulligan. And another announcement before we get started with today's talks is this new virtual meetup group for the EBPF community. We'll keep you posted about online events that you won't want to miss if you're interested in this amazing technology. I looked at this uh, group earlier this morning and there were already 36 people signed up and we hadn't even announced it yet. This is the first time we're announcing it. So I hope that's going to be really popular and a really great way for people to interact about EBPF. So if you registered for the conference beforehand, we asked why you're interested in eBPF. And we got some great answers. A lot of them were really practical, like I want to be able to observe my systems better or I want to understand the potential of eBPF. And some of them were pretty funny, like I'm a beekeeper and I got lost. <laughs> Shout out to whoever said that they love Cilium and Kubernetes. We do too. Okay, so now that we now that we are all excited about UPF and the amazing things that we're going to do today, let's take a look at the agenda. So first of all, thank you so much to everyone who submitted talks. We had over 80 submissions to choose from, and we were only able to make those choices thanks to the help and support from our wonderful program committee. We've got three fantastic keynote talks that I'm really excited to hear. Coming up in just a moment, we'll hear from Brendan Gregg, who will be talking about why eBPF is essential. And then we have Jean Yang sharing her vision for eBPF everywhere. At the end of the day, Cilium maintainer and a good friend, Joe Stringer, will be talking about building the kernel of tomorrow with eBPF. We've divided the talks into themes during the day. So you'll find groups of talks that cover eBPF for specific areas like networking or observability or security. Please do check out the details in the full schedule on the website to find out all the details of the talks that we'll be sharing today. I also particularly want to call out that we'll be introducing this year's Capture the Flag Challenge in around 40 minutes time. And we also have a little surprise that I cannot wait to share with you coming up at the end of the day. So do not miss that session at the end after Joe's closing keynote. Don't miss Joe's keynote either. So we've already told you about our Slack channel, and I hope you've joined already. This is where we're seeing just, you know, folks from all over the world joining us and, and saying hello and telling us where they're from. This is where we'll also be hosting all of the Q&A today. So right before a talk, you'll see a thread come up uh, titled after that talk. Inside of that thread, please put your questions as soon as you can think of them. And, you know, this is just one of the ways that we get to really express our gratitude for all of the work that our speakers have put in to making these presentations wonderful. So please, as you think of questions, put them in that thread. And I know the speakers would be delighted to, 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 to answer them. You can also emoji or vote, if you will, on questions. And that, you know, might assure that we get those questions up. Um, during the live Q&A sessions, we'll be able to raise those questions to the screen. So you'll be able to get to see those things. You'll, you'll be able to get to see your screen, your question on YouTube if you put them in there. And if you're enjoying eBPF Summit today, help us tell other people about it. There are so many social media platforms these days. So wherever you're hanging out, whether it's Mastodon or Twitter or Threads or LinkedIn or Blue Sky or 
wherever ever else. We do have the EBPF Summit hashtag. And let's tell the world about this amazing technology and this wonderful community that we have here around EBPF. So I think it's time we introduce our first speaker and our first talk. I remember first seeing Brendan Gregg presenting about EBPF several years ago. I think it was probably yeah. 2017. And he's certainly one of the pioneers <laughs> of using this technology. Yeah. Now, Brendan is based in Australia, so it's literally the middle of the night right now for him. But we are really delighted that he agreed to record this keynote presentation for us. So please welcome and express your excitement in Slack to welcome Fast by Friday, why eBPF is essential. G'day. What would it take to solve any computer performance issue in five days? Imagine solving the performance of anything. Operating systems, kernels, web browsers, phones, applications, websites, your company's website. I think websites should load in the blink of an eye. What would it take for us to fix the performance of everything to make that possible? Here's a vision I call Fast by Friday. Any performance issue reported on Monday should be solved by Friday or sooner. Fast by Friday is a vision. It's also a way of thinking. So that if you solve something and it takes a month, instead of that being great, that needs to be faster. You want to be able to do this by Friday in one week. And what changes will you have to make to make that possible? It's a call for action so that we can create the tools and changes to make Fast by Friday possible. It's a methodology which I'll go through to follow, and it's also a practical deadline. My dream has been to completely understand the performance of everything, and now I want to do this in five days. Why this matters. If you look at what happens in performance, Computers get faster, libraries get faster, there's new versions of applications, there's new design patterns for programming. If you take any given computer-based product, maybe that's your company's website, it could be a microservice or something, you would expect every year things to improve. And I've mocked up a hypothetical graph here, and it's shaped similar to Moore's Law. But in reality, I often see performance look like this, where there can be months or years where performance improvements stall. There are two problems. The first is where bottlenecks aren't found in time, and it may take months and maybe even years to find out what was holding back performance for that product. The second problem is where there's also not enough time, but to properly probably analyze all of the different software, hardware, and tunable options that you can employ. And I know of some major products where this graph is so similar because of the years where the developers didn't have time, the operators didn't have time to test out all of those new hardware options, all of those new software things that you can do and tunables that you can set. And years went by where the performance of the product didn't really improve. The problem is computers are getting increasingly complex. I've drawn a diagram here of showing how computers and now there's so many more things. There's accelerators, FPGAs, TPUs, DPUs. We're using GPUs more often and IPUs now. The company I work for is creating many of these, but software is actually even worse than this. There are many more layers and things we have to worry about with containers and service meshes and so on that we need to debug. Because of this complexity, performance issues can go and solve for weeks, months, or even years. But the other problem is that product decisions can miss improvements as the analysis and tuning, the evaluation of should we go with this hardware or that hardware, this tunable or that tunable, this programming language or that programming language, 
the analysis takes too long and the evaluation takes too long. A common scenario of product vendors, and I've, I'm working at one now and I've worked at one in the past, is where you feel your product is probably the fastest, but there's likely some configuration or tunable error. But it's the final week of the customer eval. You have to make it fast by Friday, otherwise the customer will kick you out. And if you think about it, your company has invested in building what's probably the fastest product. But the problem isn't that investment, it's the speed to analyze it and make sure it's tuned and configured properly in a very complicated environment. Why this matters, timely performance analysis allows you to pick faster and more efficient options. That's great for the environment, less cycles, energies and carbon. It's good for innovation. This rewards real investment in engineering and rewards engineering jobs. And of course, it's good for companies, less compute expense and end users. So how are we going to make things fast by Friday? For definitions, for any computer performance issue, by issues I mean bottlenecks, evaluations or any performance activity, and solved by Friday, I really mean the root cause is known. Sometimes to actually push a change, there are some other things that can't be sped up, but getting to the point where it is solved in one week. Here's the proposed agenda, and I'll go through each of these. Before you start, everything has to work on Monday so that you can hit the ground running with performance analysis. Critical analysis tools, which I call crisis tools, must be pre-installed. And if you're in an enterprise operating system, like an enterprise Linux distro, these should be there out of the box. So on Linux, there'll be things like ProcPS, Systat, Linux Tools Common for Perf, BCC Tools, and BPF Trace. Stack tracing and symbols should work on day one, and that's for the kernel, for libraries, and applications. I can tell you many times I've helped with performance issues, we lose the first two weeks just getting all of that stuff turned on before we can start the analysis. This should all be done beforehand, preparation. Tracing, host and distributed tracing must work. The performance engineers must already have access to root via SSH on the host so that they can run all of the different privileged analysis tools. A functional diagram of the system must be known so that the performance engineers know what they're looking at. And it helps if the source code is available. I've put the, what I feel is the current industry status for each of these steps. And I feel at the moment we're doing very badly for this kind of preparation. And so when I jump onto new service and help new customers, there's just so many steps. It takes us weeks before we can really begin diving deep. And this should be done beforehand. So it's now Monday, you can start your analysis. The first thing is, I like to start with the problem statement method. I didn't come up with this, this has been used in the industry for decades. I remember it was used by the field engineers at Sun Microsystems, and I published a, a generic problem statement methodology in my systems performance book. And this is something you can do over the phone to figure out if the problem is real and to try to figure out the magnitude of the problem. What makes you think there is a performance problem? Has the system ever performed well? What changed recently? Can the problem be expressed in terms of latency or runtime? And so on. The next methodology that's great to start with is static performance tuning. That's where you're looking at the system without load. And you can do this on an idle system. You check all the software and hardware components, the versions, past error, and their configuration. And I cover doing that in systems performance as well. Because why get into all the complicated intricacies of a dynamic workload when it may simply be a configuration error? Once those are out of the way, then you can get into load versus implementation. A lot of performance issues happen because there's new unexpected load is happening. And that's usually solved by basic monitoring and line charts. I've given this 4 out of 5 because we're usually pretty good at these steps. On Tuesday, 
Before lunch, I would start with a recent issue checklist. And that's where you want to go through the last or the most common 12 issues that you see and check if they're present, just because it's an it's a, a effective and practical use of time. To do that recent issue checklist, often you need some new tools for this. So you can do ad hoc, hoc checks to see if you're experiencing something. I should also note that these kind of things are being automated by AI these days, AI auto tuners who can go through much longer lists quickly and see if you're hitting those issues and then automatically apply the tuning. Uh, I work for Intel and Intel has one product called Granulate for that. Once you pass the recent issues, I think practically to solve any performance issue by Friday, you have to narrow down because it's impossible to deep dive on everything. And this is where I see we need new tools to exonerate components and to show that they aren't a problem and you can take them off the operating table and focus on what is more likely to be the problem. Once we've created these tools, you can turn them into GUIs of traffic lights. And these tools can also include experiments, micro benchmarks. So now I'm talking about needing new tools and the current, current industry status is not great, but eBPF is a superpower that we can use to answer any software performance question. And we can do this in production without restarting anything in situ and immediately. The current eBPF tools, I created a lot of these to support later, deeper methodologies, things like workload characterization, latency analysis, the use method, and so on. And so the, those are the tools that end in Snoop for doing the event logs, top, stat, count, slower, and so on. But for Fast by Friday, I see we need new tools. We need elimination tools so that we can narrow down and eliminate things where the problem isn't. And so I'd call them something health or something diagnosis. So you could have a TCP health and you might, might have an ext4 health tool and so on. I also think these should be open source and in the target code repo. They should not be in the current BCC or BPF trace repositories or proprietary. So to be specific, a Linux subsystem health tool should be in Linux, just like the unit tests. And it should be ideally written by the developers who best understand their own code. These are going to be complicated tools to write to exonerate systems. By putting them in the repository, they're open source, everyone can build upon them, and they'll also get maintained in lockstep with the target code. Wednesday, profiling. CPU flame graphs and off CPU flame graphs, these actually solve most performance issues as it's a great way to see, in terms of the de developer's code, what the CPUs are doing and what you're blocked on. It does need that pre-Monday preparation, so you need to get stacks and symbols to work. eBPF is a big help here because with CPU flame graphs, eBPF can be more efficient because we can do in-kernel aggregations. And we can also do custom eBPF stack walkers and walk through run times and do other things. Off CPU flame graphs, they're not really practical without eBPF because you have to trace scheduler events or do other things. And eBPF allows us to make that more efficient and practical. Thursday. If you get to Thursday, it's a difficult issue. It's, it's not one of the recent issues. It's not a simple issue of load. It didn't show up in the flame graphs. So now it's time to drill down on latency and to break up the operations of an application into subcomponents and keep drilling down to find the source of the issue. And you want latency histograms from different layers for comparison or heat maps so you can see latency over time, a visualization that I invented previously. Latency outliers, because you may just care about them and not really the modes. So you can drill down to the origin. Logs and event tracing are great for getting down into those difficult issues as well. You may, there may be patterns of events that cause the issue. And then finally, critical path analysis. At this point, it can be for multi-threaded tracing or distributed tracing, but that's where you want to look at how, the requ how requests have been processed by the application or program, whatever it is, 
and to find out what's the blocking path that's stopping things in parallel from making forward progress. This is another area where eBPF is a great help. So eBPF tools, the, the disk tools give latency distributions or histograms. There's the slower tools to, to look at outliers. There's the snoop tools for doing the custom event logs, BPF tracing, do whatever you want. And for critical path analysis for distributed tracing in the future, when faster U probes, when that work has been done, which is not currently done, I see it would be practical that we can trace library calls and calls between API endpoints without even restarting anything, without having to instrument the code just by using eBPF automatically. I wouldn't do that today because we have to do work with U probes and the overhead is too high. But that's another exciting area where eBPF is going to make a huge difference. And then finally, Friday. At this point, you've likely solved pretty much all the performance issues. And you've got flame graphs, and there's not really an obvious issue there. You've got event logs, there's not really an obvious issue there, and you've, you've used eBPF to instrument the stack. But there can still be more performance wins to find. And this is the area of looking at efficiency. This is a largely unsolved problem. I've done some of this in the past, where, we look, where I'm looking at cycles per request, and nowadays carbon per request. One approach that actually worked well was a long time ago, I worked on a storage appliance, and it supported different protocols. And I was able to micro benchmark it with the same request across those protocols. And I've got a mock-up table here to show the example killer cycles per request. I did this for all sorts of different types of workloads. And the results matched my gut feeling based on the code bases, then maturity to show that which implementations were more CPU efficient than other implementations. Once you have something like that, you could look at it in, in my example, say, well, MFS V3, that's much more efficient than everything else, certainly SIFs. And so SIFs could go maybe four or five times faster. You can see how now making decisions and inference based on efficiency on purely the comparative data. That's great if it's possible, but sometimes it's not possible. You don't have things to compare it to. And I think that's another opportunity for more eBPF tools and also doing modeling and theory. And there's, there's a lot of work in this area. And to use faster algorithms to improve efficiency as well. So big old notation and looking for wins there. After the week of analysis, case studies and retrospective. I try, I try as much as possible to share things on my blog and share things in conference talks to help out other people. And so document things as a case study, have it on your internal Jira, Wiki, Gists, external blog posts and talks if you can, you can redact them. It's great if you can include flame graphs because sometimes you can solve performance issues years later that you didn't spot at the time. And if you keep seeing the same issue over, over and over, add it to Tuesday's recent issue checklist. And for retrospectives, how do you debug it faster by Friday if it took longer than Friday? And I mentioned earlier, this is a new way of thinking. Previously, when you solve some difficult issue and it took a month, you'd be happy you solved the issue. I would, I would always beat myself up and think, oh, why did it take a month? Why couldn't I have done that in one week? And so Fast by Friday helps communicate and encourages this way of thinking. It should only take a week. Computers are pretty complicated. I'm not saying fast by 5 p.m. or fast by lunchtime, because there is a lot of things to check. But I think we can do it in one week. We're going to need new tools. We're going to have to come up with, follow this methodology and, and come up with, with ways to, to eliminate areas. And AI will be a help as well. But I think it's a reasonable target. My current industry ratings, we're not currently good at this. It can take, it can take many weeks, it can take many months to solve issues. But eBPF is essential for making this dream a reality, being able to solve the performance of anything, improve everything, make websites load in the blink of an eye. 
So my takeaways are fast by Friday. Any computer performance issue reported on Monday should be solved by Friday or sooner. eBPF is essential for this as it's production safe and allows all sorts of new tools to be created and used. And this will take all of us many years to accomplish. There'll be operating system changes necessary, such as supporting frame pointers and other stack walkers, kernel support, new tools, methodologies. But this is a goal, a realistic goal that we can work on and accomplish for all of those benefits, for the environment, for innovation, for companies and for end users. Thank you very much for watching and I look forward to helping you make your products fast by Friday. So let's give a big round of emoji applause in Slack for that really great talk by Brendan. And Brendan, if you're watching either now or later, thank you so much for being part of the summit today. Since it is the middle of the night for Brendan in Australia, I don't think he's going to be here to answer questions. He's certainly not available live. I don't think he's uh, live in Slack right now. But please post your questions anyway, and I'm sure he'll be happy to help later on. If you find that thread in Slack about Brendan's talk, you'll see there's some really great discussion stimulated by that. For example, there's been quite a lot of talk about whether performance tools should be distributed alongside every application. So, uh, yeah, keep this kind of discussion going. That's why we're here. So thanks again to Brendan. We've heard now from him why eBPF is essential. And our next keynote speaker will be continuing that theme by talking about her vision for eBPF Everywhere. So I am very happy to introduce Jean Yang. Hi, everyone. It's great to meet you. I am super excited to be here with a group of fellow eBPF enthusiasts. And I'm sure I am preaching to the choir when I say that eBPF is going to be the most important uh, tool in uh, dev tools. But I may not be preaching to the choir when I say the next part, which is that it will be the most important solution that nobody has heard of. And I believe we should keep it that way. So uh, I, uh, like most of you here, I started out, um, or like many of you here, I started out following a common eBPF playbook which is you build something cool with eBPF because you realize all the things that Brendan has talked about. eBPF is super powerful. It lets you do mission impossible type of things. It lets you get in there, really understand your system. And then um, I waited for uh, you know, the, the profit part to happen. And I realized that there, there have to be a few more steps for eBPF to really become the uh, the under, underpinning technology for some very powerful uh, tools. And so um, this talk, uh, the, be the beginnings of this talk really came about uh, at one point last year when I was sort of just going around saying, hey, we have this cool eBPF based tool. And I really wasn't getting a lot to work with um, in, the, in the general public. And I, um, as a former scientist, I formed a hypothesis that maybe eBPF, the word, uh, the term alone isn't enough to, to draw crowds. I did a few Twitter polls and um, it turns out that eBPF is not a very popular term uh, outside of this community. Uh, which I think is not a showstopper. This actually started a really interesting conversation between uh, Bill Mulligan, who is um, a, a core member of the eBPF community and me, and that is what led to this talk. So this talk is gonna be about my personal story about how I identified one of these problems that seemed really, really hard, if not impossible to solve otherwise. I had come upon eBPF as a solution to this problem for myself. I um, encountered some obstacles, including, you know, people thinking the term eBPF is boring, but then there, there's some more uh, serious technical obstacles in there too. 
I came away still believing that eBPF is really going to be the thing. But um, I have some thoughts on uh, how, how we as a community can overcome these obstacles to have eBPF underpin everything. And um, as you can tell, I don't have um, a, a graphic designer at my beck and call to do these slides. So I made this really beautiful graphic myself. Uh, you, you guys can feel free to reuse it. Um, and first, just a little bit about me, because you might be wondering, who's this gene person? Um, you know, what, what's she doing telling us about eBPF? We know way more. Um, so uh, I came from a programming languages research background. I was a tenure track professor at Carnegie Mellon in the programming languages group. I left academia to start a company called Akita Software that is uh, was based on using eBPF to do drop-in API monitoring. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got there, lessons we learned there. A lot of my eBPF related lessons are around Akita. And I'm currently the head of product and observability at Postman. So Akita got acquired by Postman earlier this year. We've been integrating our eBPF based technology there. Um, if you uh, want to work on this and you're looking for somewhere to work, reach out to me. Um, I am pretty easy to find on the internet, although I now realize I didn't put on the slides how to find me. Uh, you can find me on the Slack later. But um, yeah, I would, I would really be curious to hear uh, from all of you about your experiences around eBPF2 because I have just one set of experiences here. All right, so my whole relationship with eBPF started with um, a lot of software teams telling me we don't know often what's going on with our software systems. So this is actually the reason I left academia to work on dev tools and industry. I, I was working on type systems, static analysis, dynamic analysis, pretty fancy stuff. And um, people just kept on telling me, Gene, everything you're saying is great, but you know, we don't really know what we're running or where it's running or a bunch of pretty basic things about our system. So can't really do much until we figure that out. And so, um, you know, I, I dug in a little more and the software teams that I was uh, looking to get feedback from in, in industry would, would always tell me, well, we don't know what endpoints we have or when something bad happens with one of the endpoints. And I would say, well, what about all of the monitoring and observability tools that you already have? You know, there's Datadog, that's pretty popular. New Relic was very popular at the time. Um, it just seemed like, you know, people, people should have things more under control than what I was hearing from software teams. Looks like we're having some difficulty with Jean's connection. She's doing this live, so we'll see if we can get Jean back here and continue with the presentation. So <clears throat> stay tuned while we try and get that figured out. Also, if you have any questions or comments, um, we actually just saw a live sighting of Brendan Gregg, probably at some crazy hour for Brendan. What time would it be? It's 2.06 in the morning. <laughs> My goodness. So... Great to see Brendan here. Great to see so much activity in the chat. I'm so glad you're all here with us. I'm loving all of these wonderful comments. We've seen um, we've seen a bunch of people joining us from all over the world. Uh, some examples here. Let's see. We have Marga joining us from Germany. We have <coughs> Mauricio from Colombia. We have Rico from Taiwan. We had a bunch of people earlier from South. Korea, we had uh, we have folks come joining us, Sevi joining us from Amsterdam. Just a lot of really great interaction in the chat and a lot of really great opportunities here. So just having a tremendous day so far. Here in just a minute, we should be able to get going again. Um, but yeah, one of the one of the comments that we've seen on Gene's talk so far was this one from Josh Bigley saying the most important solution that nobody has ever heard of. So true. I mean, it is amazing that eBPF is everywhere, but it's one of those funny things that like, um, we still, you know, it's still something of a quiet technology. So, 
bear with us for just a minute while we get Gene back here. Otherwise, <clears throat> let's see. There's been a ton of comments on the on Brendan's talk as well. And we were assuming that Brendan would be sleeping. He probably is at least a little sleepy. But some of the conversation that uh, was was kicked up there that I thought was actually super interesting are things like, you know, should the should the debug or should those performance tools that Brendan is referring to be shipped with the product itself, or should that be part of the operating system? And that's a great question. You know, it's like one of those things where like you know, if you were to instrument the kernel with EPF or make that instrumentation in such a way that you would just ship it with the operating system, would you be able to, you know, debug and troubleshoot a lot more applications a lot more aptly, as it were? And so it's a great, it's a great line of thought. I really like where that's going. Let's see. I think what we're going to do is we're probably going to go to the Probably going to go into the CTF for now, and then when we get Gene back, we should be able to come into come, maybe get Gene back later in the day. But for now, I think we should probably move forward here. So, um, next up, coming right up, we're going to be going into the CTF. We're going to do an introduction to the CTF. Looking forward to that. And at that point, we should be able to, I should be able to introduce you to two of my favorite people, Liz Rice and Dan Finneran, who will be talking about the amazing CTF that we have present, that we have for you all. Hi, so let's say welcome to Dan Finneran, who has been producing this year's EBPF Summit, Capture the Flag. So Dan, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, I hope everybody's enjoying the EBPF Summit so far. Uh, my name is Dan Finneran. I'm a community advocate uh, at, at iSurveillant. Um, you know, kind of here helping grow the community, get people interested in EBPF um, and things like that. And you've been working on the CTF. What can we expect this year? Yeah, uh, so it's been a real privilege and a pleasure to uh, put together a, a CTF for everybody to to get their hands into. Um, the CTF, as with all of the CTFs that have been part of EBPF Summit over the last four years, follows on uh, the fantastic narrative all around Star Wars. And before I even kind of continue, I have to really kind of a uh, big shout out to to Quentin, who who creates these amazing backstories, um, which kind of you know, kind of gives a story around everything that's happening uh, with the CTF. So, effectively, the the CTF problem has uh, two modes: this is a, a slightly easier version and a, a harder version for um, running the CTF. In the first mode, it's uh, it's expected behavior; uh, it, it will exhibit its expected behavior. But it's going to be a little bit easier. It should be a little bit easier for people to kind of understand what's what's kind of happening. With the harder mode, we've kind of hidden a few things. We've made it a little bit more difficult. Um, you're going to potentially need to make use of different userland tools, techniques. You could potentially a bit more knowledge of VPF, right? Potentially, yep, absolutely. So the other mode we've dubbed uh, hard mode, all in capital letters. Um, and as mentioned, you know, you're probably going to need a little bit more knowledge into eBPF too. To solve to solve that one. Uh, sorry, yeah. Before I, before I kind of move on uh, to get access to the the CTF. So uh, the URL is on the slide at the moment. If you go to uh, ISO go to CTF 2023, you'll get to the GitHub repository where that amazing backstory is, and it will also then get you access to the CTF. And without kind of ruining the story, uh, you know, the TLDR is that. Um, it, simply, you need to find a process and and kill that process. So, you know, you'll you'll get access to the CTF, and um, you need to discover what's kind of access in the file system. So, there'll 
there's a, there'll be a couple of files in the root file system. There'll be a slash ebpf dot summit, um, and you need to kill that process that's accessing that file. How simple is that? <laughs> you make it sound easy. Uh, are there any tips and tricks that you can help the audience with? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, kind of where to begin. Um, I would probably think about you know the behavior. Uh, of what's actually kind of occurring, what the program is actually doing, potentially maybe watching for for those sorts of behaviors. Um, you know, we know that we're going to have the audience is going to be either uh, eBPF experts or they're going to be eBPF beginners. So, you know, we, we wanted to make it uh, accessible for a lot of different people in terms of how they, they could go ahead uh, solving the problem. So, um, we have the eBPF Summit CTF spoilers in there. We want people to share uh, the results of the CTF. So when they've when they've completed the CTF, you'll you'll get a code um, that we can kind of kind of paste in there. But also every hour or so, we're going to kind of help you a little bit with suggestions, tips and tricks. We'll answer questions. Um, and as I say, you know, the goal of the CTF really is is about learning. It's you know. Obviously, it's about solving the CTF, but it, it's about how you solve the CTF. So if you can kind of thread in your solution, because we would really love to hear, you know, kind of your your thought process, your path to solving the CTF, how you end about it and things like that. So can you explain just a little bit more about what happens when you complete the CTF? Yep, absolutely. So as I mentioned, um, something is running, something is accessing files. You need, to, you need to kill whatever it is that's doing that. Easy peasy. Um, when you finally do that, what will happen is the, the slash ebpf.summit file will, will finish off the story. So you'll get the rest of the amazing narrative uh, that Quentin has put together for us, um, which you know hopefully will be part of CTF Summit 2024. We'll continue the amazing story, uh, amazing storyline. Um, but also you'll, you'll get the, uh, a code, and that code... Uh, we would like you to to paste into the eBPF Summit uh, CTF spoilers channel. Yeah, big shout out to Quentin for all his work on the storylines over the years. Yes, absolutely. All right. And then uh, we're going to be back online again on Friday during the eBPF and Cilium office hours. Uh, I think it's two o'clock UK time on Friday. And we're going to have a bit of a post-mortem about this CTF, right? We're going to review some of the different approaches that people will have used because there's more than one way to solve this problem yeah. so uh, we're hoping to learn about some new ways from people posting their solutions into uh spoilers absolutely yeah as i say we want to we want to see how you do it we want to you know we i just you know we're excited to see the different ways people go about it and then as you mentioned on friday we'll we'll dissect uh some of my code uh, which is Probably going to be quite embarrassing, but we, you know, we'll, we'll kind of do that. We'll step through what's actually happening with eBPF and, you know, how how you go about solving these sorts of things. I'm discussing, you know, the tooling that you can use to to go ahead and and, and solve these sorts of problems. Fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to that on Friday. Um, we will share links to the Echo session for those of you who want to come and join us on Friday to hear more about. Uh, how the CTF was solved and perhaps a bit about how it was written. I think we've also got a little picture that we wanted to show of uh, one of our friends. Uh, do you want to just talk us through this picture? Sure, ab absolutely. <laughs> so um, this is my good friend, David Flanagan, or Raw Code, as you may know him. Um, you know, I was wanted to make sure that we did a good CTF for everybody. We wanted to run it by some of our top people. So um, I had uh, David sit with my laptop for about 15, 16, 17 minutes or so. Largely complaining about that my trackpad direction and my terminal setups and things like that, but um, with some slight encouragement from me, he kind of got to the end of the the CTF and and you know, kind of solved the challenge. So uh, it's been thoroughly tested for everybody, and I hope everybody enjoys it. Fantastic, absolutely agree. I hope everyone enjoys it. Best of luck if you're trying it out. I'm looking forward to giving it a whirl before we do that echo session on Friday. While we've been talking about the CTF, good news. Uh, Jean had some internet outage issues. I believe she is now connected back to us using mobile internet. So everyone cross your fingers that this holds up. Let's bring back Jean to recommence or you know restart partway through her talk about her vision for eBPF everywhere. 
Hi, everyone. Thanks, Liz. Sorry about that. Uh, apparently, the internet in our entire greater area is out. So fingers crossed that tethering works. All right, cool. So where I left off was, um, you know, I discovered people don't know as much about their systems as they would hope or I would hope. I asked, what about all the tools you have? And um, I learned that the state of logging and monitoring today is um, much more manual than I would have thought before I dug into this problem. And so what people told me was like, the existing solutions are great if I know what I wanna track and how to track it. So I know exactly what dashboard I want to monitor something because I know which endpoints I have and want to monitor. And um, alternatively, I know exactly what I want out of traces I'm getting out of my system. Uh, you know, using something like LightSup or Honeycomb is great for that. What people told me was if they want information out of their system they didn't predict or there's part of their underlying system they don't know exactly uh, what it looks like or even that it's there, things get much harder. And then what I was hearing was very smart people were telling me, hey, I don't have the kind of control I would like over my system. And what I discovered is if you aren't the person who originally built the system, and especially if the people who originally built the system aren't there, it gets even harder. So imagine a company that was started, you know, 15, 20 years ago, many companies are uh, fit that profile today. Um, uh, one of our Akita users that did a blog post with us about this problem is Flickr. You know, every, everyone has seen it. Everyone has seen it for, you know, 10, 15 plus years. And um, what they told me was, look, we have a lot of endpoints that, that have been around since the beginning of time and uh, or beginning of Flickr time. And it's not easy for us to use these modern tools to understand what's going on because there's stuff that's not as well documented as we'd like. There's stuff that we don't know all the details of how it works. And so that led me to uh, the problem statement for what we were building at Akita. First of all, we wanted as little install friction as possible. We learned that especially on these systems where people didn't have their heads around the entire system, needing to instrument the code or needing to, uh, uh, needing even to drop in a library, which means updating a bunch of other code dependencies was not tenable. We wanted to be as accessible as possible to developers who don't fully understand their own systems. So especially with the increased churn in the software industry, the rise of junior teams, and just um, the general aging of the software industry, or I guess the maturation of the software industry, um, there's, um, you know, there, there's just a lot more barrier to entry for, for, you know, people understanding their own systems. And we wanted to introduce as few new concepts as possible, because what we saw was developers who are working to ship and maintain on systems that they don't completely understand, they're often overloaded in other ways too. And this is how we came upon eBPF. Uh, it's very powerful. You know, everything Brendan said, you get all kinds of information at system and networking levels. It's versatile. You have applications and performance, security, and more. Brendan gave a great talk. I won't repeat it. Um, and also, I just uh, want to point out using eBPF made a lot of sense for us. Uh, you, you never look dumb by using eBPF. If Datadog, F5, VMware, Cloudflare, they're all rolling out. Uh, their eBPF offerings, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, there's buzz for a reason. It's a very useful, powerful software. So we just thought, hey, you know, this is super cool. eBPF solves all of our problems, we think. Let's go with it. And then we rolled out V0 of our solution and we learned some things. So the initial feedback, uh, so what we did was we rolled out a solution that used eBPF to watch all of the API traffic of a system. Then we showed users, here's all of the API traffic that you've seen. And uh, they said, look, look guys, we came to you to be less overwhelmed, not more overwhelmed. And our first response was, wait a minute, you said you wanted to understand everything about your system. You didn't understand it. And they were like, yeah, maybe there's a reason. <laughs> we didn't try to understand the, the whole thing. And so the first piece of feedback we got when we started using eBPF was what's all this data? And so one thing we learned is if you're using another solution, like if you're using Honeycomb, which requires you to instrument your endpoints and then it shows you which endpoints you instrumented, it's very hard to get overwhelmed because what you get is what you put in. 
And so people can't easily get themselves to a place where just way too much data is being thrown at them. What we found was when we started using eBPF to show people everything that was going on, this quickly became overwhelming because people were like, oh my gosh, I have 10,000 endpoints in my system I didn't know about. Maybe I should just turn this off and not know about it again. So they told us, you know, we came to you to have an easier life. We don't want to see more information about our systems that we don't have time to make sense of. And so we learned one danger of, you know, this power of seeing everything about your system is if people don't know what to do with it, they would rather not know. And then um, the other big piece of feedback was uh, a lot of our users who actually showed up before we started really using this word eBPF all over the place said, it doesn't sound like eBPF is for me. And so there was a period of time when we realized, oh, wow, this eBPF technology we're using, it's very hot. Lots of other people are excited about it. And so we put this big, you know, powered by eBPF on our website, and we actually saw fewer, fewer signups. So um we, uh, it was primarily eBPF enthusiasts and security people who knew they were looking for eBPF. And when we dug in with our existing users who had signed up before, what they said was, look, um, it, you know, it, it sounds, we, we didn't know what eBPF was before we started using you guys. We came to you because you advertised low friction install and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, it, it's not a technology we really identify with as being for us. And so we went back to the drawing board after this and, you know, it, we said it seems like we should address this first question of this eBPF based solution, throwing too much data at the users. And so we came to see eBPF as a low friction data source, but it's just the beginning of what we're doing with the data. So we integrated our agent to watch API traffic at the network level. I'll point out we're primarily using BPF and not the extended features. Um, while we spent a lot of time automating around agent install. So one thing we found was people would say, okay, drop in, but drop in where? Turned out our initial solution required people to know how they deployed Kubernetes or how they were deploying whatever they were deploying. So we spent a lot of time automating the install of the, the BPF-based solution on top of that. And then um, we also spent a lot of time, one to two years actually, uh, building algorithms to analyze the eBPF data so that we were showing less of it. So we built algorithms to automatically detect endpoint structure, endpoints of interest, so which endpoints are slow, which endpoints are, th are throwing errors. We spent a lot of time doing uh, UX work to show people fewer endpoints up front so as not to overwhelm them. And um, then, uh, the, the, then that really cut down on the amount of information we were starting to, to give to users. And so what eBPF ultimately allowed us to do at Akita was it uh, allowed us to build a solution that required very little work to set up. So we were able to let people integrate within uh, five to 20 minutes. They could drop us in. Uh, I would say a lot of that uh, cutting down the onboarding time was automation around the install of eBPF and not so much you know, using eBPF to do more. Uh, eBPF also allowed us to require very little work or expertise to, to have users get value out of our system. So after we implemented the algorithms to analyze the eBPF data, people were able to uh, install us and start seeing their slowest endpoints or their endpoints with errors within five minutes of install. And that was really the magical moment. And uh, once we got all this in place, we were able to appeal to overwhelmed developers by automatically staying up to date with changes. And so uh, something that we did a lot of work on was figuring out how to alert people what was new about the whole setup so they didn't have to figure out where to look. And um, the lesson there was we just didn't mention eBPF. We said, look, you can install us in 30 minutes. You can get results in five minutes and we keep you up to date. And those those ended up being the the things that that you know led led to uh, the the step three profit, not the declaration of use of eBPF itself. So I think we're you know as much as I like to think we're special, I, I think that our our story is probably not unique in the greater community. And so I will uh, I'll just sum up a couple lessons from us. First, eBPF alone doesn't make developer experience better. So initially, we just thought this is such a powerful solution. Dropping it in should be enough. Uh, working on install and working on algorithms for better consuming the data were really key for us. 
Um, something that was surprising to me was eBPF was not only not a positive for our users, many of them, it was a negative because they would hear it say, I don't get it and think that the tool would be hard to use. And so actually moving away from saying eBPF was very important uh, for us. And there are very hard technical developer experience problems around eBPF. I know a lot of the last few years has been about getting the technology more stable, uh, getting more, more data in to the eBPF data source, but I really hope the next five, 10 years is about getting, uh, getting some of these rough edges smoothed around use. And I really believe if we do all that, eBPF is going to take over everything. I think eBPF is incredible for its ability to let people drop into solutions. I believe eBPF will become mainstream when the developer experience becomes accessible enough for mainstream developers. I think we're getting there. I don't think we're there yet. And I also believe that we will have succeeded when most developers haven't heard of eBPF at all. Just like Intel inside isn't really a thing, like no one knows really what chips are being used inside. I, I think one day there's going to be eBPF underlying a lot of tools that want this frictionless install, that want this magic five, uh, five minute or less onboarding. And it's going to be up to us as a tool development community to really build the algorithms and the developer experience to make that accessible. So I'm super excited to be part of this community. I'd love to hear from all of you your ideas around making eBPF more accessible. And I really think that we're gonna take over the world. Couldn't agree more. That was a tremendous talk. And thank you so much for uh, you know, coming back and just like, you know, being able to pick up the pieces and keep going. That was amazing. Like <laughs> it's really hard to do. Thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah. Let's see what we had some questions that came up uh, during your talk, which I thought would be worth like bringing up here. One of the questions was from Dan saying, what process, what was your process for automating the install of eBPF? Because as you pointed out, there's definitely difficulties around it. Uh, that is a great question. And I wish I had a shorter answer, but um, the, the long answer is per platform very carefully. And so for every single platform, there's kind of a set of permissions that you need to get libpcap install, et cetera, uh, to figure out what version people are running. And so it was really just, you know, burning down all of the, the manual steps of install and, and automating them. And, and we're not, we're not all the way done yet. We're, you know, it's just, it's very uh, painful in per platform, but at least it's pain on our side and not our user side. That makes sense. Another great question uh, um, from Hachik saying probably a noob question, but is watching traffic via Akita eBBF better than using something like Datadog and why? Uh, that's a great question. So Datadog also has an eBPF based solution or several. Um, I think they have golden signals and they're, they're also doing some things with AP, uh, API observability. I would say, you know, watching traffic is watching traffic. Uh, for Akita's marketing, I, I always said we're not the only eBPF based solution, but we've put the most time into automatically analyzing the traffic that we see to make life easier for you. And so I think that eventually the dif the differentiator isn't gonna be in eBPF itself, but how different tools are using that data to make life easier for you. And every tool is gonna have optimized for a different dimension of ease. And um, some tools are gonna have just straight up spent more time on it. So I would say a lot of the feedback we got even about Datadog was people were spending weeks to quarters uh, setting up all the dashboards they needed. There was, um, you know, there, there, there isn't as much automation as, as some of the teams that we were finding needed. Yeah. yeah, I mean, figuring out like what questions you want to ask of all of that data, it's definitely a whole other challenge. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so one of our goals was um, for people who don't know what questions they ask, we just would pre present them with, here's a initial set of questions. You're probably going to yeah. graduate out of this pretty quickly, we hope. But, you know, we, we get a you A place started. to start, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, I want to say thank you again so much for, for joining us. Um, there's some great topics happening in the chat, so feel free to jump in there. Um, and I would like to introduce the next talk that is coming up. This will be GPU profiling with BPF at Meta. It's going to be a ton of really great content in, in this talk. And I will see you right after this talk to say hello again. Hi everyone, my name is Rihan Salim and I'm a software performance engineer at Meta. 
where I work on building CPU and GPU profiling tools for the Metafleet. Today, we're going to be talking about how we are building a low overhead BPF based profiling solution for our GPUs. First, let's talk about why GPU profiling is important. While CPUs have a small number of strong cores, GPUs have streaming multiprocessors with a large number of weaker cores. They really excel at parallel processing, making them ideal for AI and ML. At Meta, we use these GPUs for both inference and training workflows. CUDA, or Compute Unified Device Architecture by NVIDIA, is an example of such architecture. In this session, we will talk about how we are profiling CUDA-based workflows. First, let's see what a CUDA program looks like compared to a regular CPU program. Let's say we want to create a function that adds two arrays. You will write your function code, then you will allocate the two arrays, make sure that they are populated with the right data, call the function to do the addition, print your results or use it in whichever way you want, and then you're going to free the memory. To create a CUDA program that does the same, the code looks very similar. You're going to create the CUDA function or kernel that does the addition. You're going to be allocating the memory, and depending on how this memory is allocated, you will probably want to transfer some of the memory to the GPU or make sure that it's accessible to your GPU. You're going to be calling the CUDA kernel to do the addition. You can make a decision about whether you want to wait for the kernel to finish execution or not. When it's done executing, you're going to use your data, and then you're going to free the memory. There are very few, there are few interesting things about this interaction that we just looked at. First of all, there are data transfers that are happening between the CPU and the GPU. These data transfers can be quite expensive. So ideally, you want to minimize the number of these data transfers. There is also cost associated with launching CUDA kernels, the memory operations, and so on. You'll notice that the CPU made the decision about how the work is going to be broken down when the GPU is called. The kernel call parameters and memory access patterns can have significant impact on performance. Memory is allocated and deallocated from the CPU side. This means that you can forget to deallocate memory, causing memory leaks on the GPU. Ideally, we want to maximize our GPU utilization and improve our efficiency while lowering our overheads. Understanding the GPU events, like the launch patterns, memory allocations, sync events, and so on, can help us achieve these goals. Now let's talk about the existing GPU profiling tools. There are many existing tools that can be used to profile GPUs. For example, there is Kupti, or NVIDIA's CUDA profiling tool interface, and Kinato, which is a Meta's tool that's based on it. There is DCGM, there is PyTorch Profiler, and a large number of other profilers. These profilers have their own limitations. For example, a lot of these profiling tools will require instrumentation in your code. Also, a lot of them will be running inside your process, which means that you can have performance or reliability impact from running it. There is also the lack of CPU context. In many of these tools, you will not be able to understand what exactly was happening on the CPU before the GPU event happened. BPF can help address some of these concerns. BPF is by nature very low overhead, does not require instrumentation in the user code, and can collect additional context from the CPU, like system stacks, Python stacks, memory status, and so on. BPF is also very flexible, which means that it can be expanded to cover more or less events or decide on the sampling rate without needing to change your application code. Now let's talk about GPU Snoop. GPU Snoop is Meta's BPF-based GPU profiler. It can collect things, things like kernel launch events, memory events, sync events, and a lot more. Let's use kernel launch events as an example. By hooking up to the CUDA launch kernel call, we can actually intercept every call that's happening to CUDA launch kernel, capture the kernel name, arguments, dimensions, and stack that launched the kernel. We can use this data to analyze our kernel launch stacks to understand which kernels are used more frequently and which stacks are, call are launching these kernels. We can also understand the launch arguments and dimensions and make sure that our optimizations are targeting the most frequently used arguments and dimensions for our kernel launches. In a similar way, we can intercept things like CUDA memory allocations and CUDA freeze, capture the address, and understand based on it which memory allocations are happening, which ones are freed, which ones are not freed, and identify potential memory leaks. For example, in this case, you can see that a specific stack is constantly allocating memory and not freeing it, causing a buildup of allocated memory. We can also use this data to understand at any point of time which stack has the most allocated memory, or understand how our memory allocations are happening per device or GPU. 
This data can be further expanded to be used in a lot of different ways. For example, you can compare your memory snapshot at two points of time to understand where exactly the memory allocations are happening and where you are leaking memory. BPF can be expanded to cover a lot of other events. For example, you can collect synchronization events, memory copy events, and so on. The benefit of using BPF solution is it can later be stitched with data that we got from different sources. For example, here, we have the memory allocations from BPF. We have the uh, Python stacks also from BPF, but we can also stitch this data with the data we got from Kinetto to understand exactly what was happening on the CPU and the GPU at the same time. This gives us a holistic view of the end-to-end -end, end -end, uh, performance of the system. Now let's talk about the challenges with GPU profiling based on BPF. The biggest challenge is the lack of visibility into the GPU internals. For example, when you launch a kernel, there is no guarantee that this kernel is going to start execution right away. There might be a certain duration of time on which the kernel is queued and waiting for execution. You also cannot tell how long the kernel execution took. So on the CPU side, it does not have this information, while on the GPU side, you can get this information. There is also the lack of understanding of GPU state. For example, BPF cannot tell you about your SM utilization or your memory status on the GPU. Another challenge is the volume of data. Because these events are very frequent, we need to be very aware of how much data we are collecting, which events are the most interesting, and the sampling rate. Finally, if you have application-specific context that you need to capture, it becomes harder to get this data from BPF. For example, for PyTorch, it's really important to understand your operator and uh, tensor state. This can be added using instrumentation in the, in the application code, using USDTs or strobe meta, which is a way to add uh, some information to thread local st storage, and BPF can read it later on. Now let's talk about the future plans and what we are hoping to achieve next with BPF profiling. First of all, continuous profiling. At Meta, we have continuous profiling for the CPU. And this data has been very useful for a lot of various uh, purposes. For example, we have dashboards that will detect the bad patterns in code that are wasting CPU cycles. We also use this data to find opportunities to do CPU optimizations. We use the data for feedback-driven optimization for our binaries, out-of-memory analysis, and so on. Ideally, we want to have very similar solutions for the BPF-based GPU profiler where you can go to a dashboard and find certain bad patterns, how you can optimize these patterns to save uh, your GPU utilization. Another thing that we are hoping to add is buffer data collection. And by that, we mean we want to have a way to tell when a certain event happens, what exactly led to this event. For example, when an OOM happens, it would be very interesting to understand the last N memory allocations that occurred before this OOM. For example, there could be a very large memory allocation request that caused, this, that caused the OOM to happen. Thank you so much. It's always exciting to me to see um, people using BPF in ways that I didn't expect. So profiling GPUs was definitely one of those ones that kind of came as a surprise to me. I really, we really appreciate your talk and your and in you watching this, your your ability to, um, you know, put comments in or questions into the thread for our speakers is your way of saying thank you for all of the work that went into these talks. Next up, we have a couple of engineers from University of Mercia talking about the integration of machine learning modules models with the Linux kernel through eBPF based development. Hi everyone, I'm Irene Bru, a grad student from the University of Murcia in Spain. And with my colleague Jorge Gallego, we are presenting our latest work about the integration of machine learning models within the Linux kernel using APF. The combination of these two tools have enormous potential as it can improve the accuracy of packet processing solutions and classify packets based on compressed criteria. It also provides scalability and adaptation to changing environments as machine learning algorithms can be refined and learn from past experiences. However, there are still some challenges, as EAPF programs loaded into the kernel have no access to external libraries, no support for unbounded loops or floating point operations, 
and they follow a passive event based model. These have made it difficult to implement machine learning algorithms into the Linux kernel using eBPF, and in particular, no work implementing a neural network as we are proposing today in this presentation has been found in the literature. So, our proposal is to train these models using Python machine learning library scikit-learn and then to transform the neural network into ACC code using MLearn Tiny ML library. With this, we can obtain a rise with the weights and biases of each layer of the network. However, we still have to adapt the C code of the library to make it acceptable by eBPF. And in particular, we need to address the restriction about the floating points, the loops, and the memory sharing between execution, as we explained before. The last step will be to merge this solution with a header parsing process to obtain information from the network. So our proposal to avoid these restrictions are to uh, use fi a fixed point representation to substitute the floating points. This means using 32 bits integer to represent the floating, floating points using one bit for the sign, 16 bits for the integer part, and 15 bits for the fractional part. To avoid the sigma function that is usually used in the last layer of classification neural networks, we can take into account that it's a continuous and strictly increasing function, so we can make the classification by just comparing its inputs. About the loops, we can load them into the kernel and vault. And about the header parsing process, it's really important to check the memory access boundaries to ensure that we are not accessing to a forbidden part of the kernel. Finally, about the event-driven behavior, we can use eBPF maps to uh, store information between executions. IoT security in wireless sensor network was the selected use case to demonstrate our solution. We prepared a data set using Kuya Simulator to recreate an IoT scenario with devices implementing six Lopan and Ripple. This scenario focuses on the detection of the HelloFood attack on the Ripple protocol. The goal is to determine if I know this malicious or not, which is a binary classification uh, protocol. Regarding the employed machine learning algorithm, we have selected multi-layer perceptron models, giving their flexibility and accuracy to analyze traffic and detect anomalies. After several tests with different configuration, we adopted a model with two hidden layers. In each layer, the ReLU function is used and the sigma function is employed at the end. With this, we obtain a good results aggregating the data in windows of 1, 5, and 10 seconds. The experiments were conducted using a computer to generate the traffic using TCP replay and a Raspberry Pi uh, 3 to, uh, to run the eBPF program, which processes the received packets and executes the neural network. Besides the, this full internet implementation, another version of the program was developed to decouple the neural network from the parsing mechanism and execute it in user space. In this way, we can compare the performance in both places. Here, you can see the two main outcomes of the experiments. On the left, you can see that although very similar, the CPU consumption using the internal implementation is lower than the user space one. On the right, you can see the execution time of the neural network in both implementation, depending on the time window uh, chosen. There is a notable decrease in the execution time when it is run in kernel space, and this is because we know that the uh, code can run faster in this privileged context. Uh, we consider there is these results uh, to be relevant as they show the advantages of executing a uh, complex task within the Linux kernel. As conclusions, we successfully developed a classification MLP for the kernel by using eBPF, including generalization capabilities. This provides a solid groundwork for the integration of machine learning techniques within the network data plane. As further work, uh, we are researching on other optimization techniques and machine learning models, as well as uh, its inclusion in specialized hardware. Besides, we want to test its uh, performance in a production environment. Um, well, thanks for your attention, and we'll be happy to answer questions in the chat. Thank you so much for that presentation. I know that like, you know, um, I've definitely heard in the community a few times that we need better instrumentation for what's happening with some of those machine learning models. So it's very exciting to see that kind of stuff. Next up, we have Madan coming to us from Samsung R&D. He's going to be talking about BPF for Android, how we leverage BPF for our networking solutions.
Hello everyone, I am Madan from Samsung Research. Today we will be talking about BPF for Android. How we leverage BPF for our networking solutions. This will be the agenda of today's presentation. We talk about the real-time data prioritization mode. During and post pandemic, the online video calling and online gaming skyrocketed. So we'll discuss about the problems which you, me, everyone faced. Next, we'll be quickly running through the 5G mobile hotspot and the eBPF assisted control and monitoring. First, let's start with the BPF based prioritized real time mode, a better online calling and gaming experience for our Galaxy users. The multitasking has become very common in the recent smartphones. Multiple app traffic compete with each other to grab more bandwidth. We can broadly classify the app traffic into two categories, the real-time app, such as the video calling, online gaming, XR, which are very sensitive to the loss or any jitter in the network. On the other hand, we have the bandwidth intensive applications such as downloads and your high, high quality streaming and so on. So these try to grab more bandwidth and are little okay, little tolerable to the delays. What if the real-time traffic is in the same lane of the non-real-time traffic? So definitely the video calling and the gaming would suffer. Whenever there's a download, we saw a very high latency and also a jitter in the online gaming and same in the video calling apps as well. We introduced a priority real-time lane, which can help the real-time lane go fast out of our device and to prioritize the real-time packets. Hence, we introduced our intelligent Wi-Fi data prioritization mode. Once you go to your Wi-Fi, intelligent Wi-Fi setting, you will be able to see prioritized real-time data traffic. You can enable or disable based on your need. So what it does? Let me explain you how we do this. We use our application prioritization engine. It has the intelligent traffic classification system which can segregate the real-time and non-real-time traffic. So once we have the real-time and non-real-time traffic set segregated, now we are going to prioritize the RT traffic. This is where the eBPF comes into the picture. We have our BPF scheduling programs, which can schedule the real-time traffic ahead of the non-real-time traffic. Let's see how it works. The apps in the Android are identified using the user ID. Every app you install will have a unique user ID. Let's say there are two apps, 10239 and 20546. And we want to prioritize the traffic from 10239, which can be a video calling app. There is also a limitation that we cannot use the UID information in the ingress. So we are planning to use uh, eBPF map, which can give you the unique key to identify the real time traffic. So the entire flow is like this. Once we have this egress, we just check if a specific UID has to be prioritized. If it has to be prioritized, we populate the five tuples, the protocol, source IP, source port, destination IP, and the destination port, and we get a unique key for a specific traffic. We have a different map for IPv4 and IPv6. We decide based on the type of the Wi-Fi connection. So once the packet comes in, that is the downlink packet coming from the access point to the UE, the ingress program looks into this eBPF map, V4 and V6 map, and it decides whether it has to be in the priority lane or it can be delayed or restricted. So based on our eBPF map and the scheduling eBPF programs, we are able to prioritize on the packets of 10239 or the real-time video calling apps. Next, let's see about how AP eBPF program looks like. We pin our program in the ingress and egress queues to the, with the help of TC. We have the rate at which the non-real-time traffic can flow. This is de decided upon the network condition and the predicted end-to-end -end bandwidth. 
This is how our prioritization engine works. Next, we'll be seeing about the enhanced mobile offer. With the launch of 5-speed mobile network like 5G, there's an increased trend of sharing data via mobile hotspot. We found that users are worried about the exhaustion of daily high-speed limit while sharing the internet. More the speed, more faster it can exhaust. Yes, we heard you. So we came up with this enhanced Samsung mobile hotspot. We are introducing features that will relieve you of your worries about data sharing over the mobile hotspot. We are enhancing the hotspot features which can help the end users like uh, PPF assisted monitoring of the mobile data usage in the hotspot for every clients. And we also give more control to the mobile hotspot host so that he can, he can set the data limit, time limit and so on. Also, there is a possibility of restricting some users to access the shared data. You can now amp up your data sharing experience and do more with the Samsung Mobile Hotspot. This is how the new dashboard looks like. First, we have the mobile data monitor. So you can see how much exactly the data has been shared over your mobile data. And we can also get a fine grained details like each client's, how much it has used the mobile data today. We also have other dashboards which can give you the weekly and monthly insights. Next, we also introduced a one-time password mode or we call it a OTP user. So OTP user connects using a different one-time password which is randomly generated. Here also the BPF was helping us segregating or bifurcating the OTP users with the main users. For example, if a user is connected via OTP profile, he will not be able to access the TV, which is connected via regular profile. If you click on any of the client details, you have much more to do. We can monitor the limit of the client. For example, you have a 2 GB per day and you don't want your laptop to use more than 1 GB. So you can set the daily limit. And you can also see how much it has consumed so far. There is also a time limit where you can say your kids like you can use the hotspot in your tab only for two hours or something. And also we introduce the pass internet mode. So where the BPF differentiates the data traffic from the control messages and we are able to pass the data traffic alone. So the device is still connected but just your internet is fast. Overall, this is how the BPF monitor and control looks like. A packet flows into the soft Wi-Fi or soft AP interface. It comes to the ingress and it accounts what's the current byte. So we have a unique client ID for the clients connected. So based on the client ID, it tries to find whether the client has to be passed or is there any total or global pass limit for the specific mobile data and so on. Not just this, we are building multiple use cases. eBPF, though it's simple, it's yet powerful. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you for giving this opportunity. Love seeing real world use cases. That was the first of our networking talks um, and really showing us how um, <coughs> Samsung is actually, you know, exploring this stuff. Lots of great interactivity in the chat. Lots of great questions put up in there and looking forward to hearing uh, or to seeing more engagement there. Our next talk is from Hemant uh, from Datadog. He's going to be talking about hot standby load balancing with SO reuse port and eBPF.
Hello everyone. I'm Hemant Mala. I'm a software engineer at Datadog and also a Selenium CNCF maintainer. Today, I'll be talking to you about implementing custom load balancing strategies with SRU Sport and eBBF. So, what is SRU Sport? SRU Sport is a kernel feature that allows for more than one socket to listen on the same port. Historically, when users wanted to take advantage of all the computing power on multi-core machines, they would run either one thread per core or one process per core, but they would have a single socket listening and accepting all the incoming connections, which would in turn route these connections to different processes or threads. But under heavy load, the socket quickly becomes the bottleneck. With SRU support, every thread or process can have its own dedicated socket. So in, in addition to performance improvements, with SRU support, we can implement things like zero downtime rolling updates or CPU or protocol aware load balancing. So before we dive into how to customize this behavior, let's take a look at how the default behavior looks like. So by default, sockets are selected by hashing the four tuple, which includes the source IP, source port, destination IP, and destination port. But the actual process of mapping this hash to the socket that is being selected also includes the total number of listening sockets. Because of this, if the number of listening sockets changes because the user did a rollout, the sockets that are being selected would change. And this can impact the three-way handshake. But in from 5.14, there's a new CTL flag called TCP migrate request, which can take care of this for you. So, if you wanted to implement a custom load balancing strategy, let's say like weighted load balancing or hot standby load balancing, how would we go about it? So the solution should be pretty obvious by now. We write some eBPF code. So how exactly do we do that? We write an eBPF program of type SKRU sport, and we use that in combination with a BPF map called reuse port soccer. So let's take a look at a quick demo and we'll come back to the code. So here on the window, the, in the window on the left, I'm running my server.go in the primary mode. And this server is listening on the port 8080. And once a socket is in listening state, it's going to update the socket information onto a BPF map called TCP balancing targets. And it uses the key zero as the index, and then it writes the socket information. On the right-hand side, we're running the same server.go, but under standby mode. And this server is also listening on port 8080, but it uses the index one to update its socket details onto the BPF map. Now, if you try to curl the service, we can see that we're always hitting the primary instance. And if you bring down the primary, only then we would hit the standby instance. If they bring the primary back up, the request would now go back to primary. So what's happening on this instance is that there is a BPF uh, program called hot standby selector, which is of kind SKRU support. And there's also a BPF map called TCP balancing targets of type reuse port soccer. Now, the actual BPF code is quite simple. I could actually fit it in a single slide. And here, what you can see is that there is a BPF map called TCP balancing targets of type reuse port SOC array. And then this is the actual logic that determines the socket selection. And this is the BPF program name hot standby selector of kind SKRU sport. And we saw that uh, the built-in or the primary uh, server instance was using the index zero and the fallback or standby was using the index one. So all this BBF program is trying to do is select the primary instance if it's available. If it's not available, only then use the standby instance. And here we are invoking the BPF helper function called SK, SK select reuse port, which will look, look up the BPF map and select the socket. 
And uh, the only important part in the server.go is how we set these socket options. You can do that by creating a custom listener config. And once you have a custom listener config, that should give you access to the raw connection, raw underlying connection. And on that on that socket, we can set these flags called SO reuse port and SO attach reuse port eBPF. Yeah. And all you can find all this code in the link here. And thank you. Thank you, Hamath. Great presentation. If you have questions for that presentation or you want to just say thank you for that wonderful talk, definitely go to Slack and drop that note in there. Um, we are now coming up on our first break. This break we will return to at 15 after. So we're going to have about 12 minutes off. And uh, we will see you right after that for a whole bunch of really great observability talks with the UPF.
Welcome back. I hope you had a chance to move around a bit, maybe get a drink or a snack and prepare yourself to watch some more great talks. Our next few sessions are all about observability with eBPF. And as always, if you have questions for our speakers, please look out for the thread in Slack that's specific to their talk, and that will help them find your question. Um, just add your comments there, add your emojis, let them know that you have appreciated the effort they've put into putting these talks together. So our first talk in this section is from Casey Lee from Yunshan Networks, and he will be talking about enabling zero code observability with eBPF and WebAssembly. Hello everyone, my name is Casey and I am a PM at Deflon. Today, I would like to give a presentation on the topic of enabling Delo code observability for financial applications through eBPF and WebAssembly. Implementing observability for financial applications in the form of integrating an API agent can be highly challenging. Regulatory requirements often prohibit the injection of APM agents due to potential security and stability concerns. Moreover, financial applications are often composed of multiple components provided by different third-party vendors, making it difficult to infer APM agent injection and maintain uniformity. Even if APM agents can be successfully integrated, it is difficult in process for to triage using APM agents. Infrastructure components such as DNS, MySQL, Redis, and more are difficult to instrument. Similarly, network forwarding paths like Gateway and Kubernetes CNI plus challenges for instrumentation. The floor will achieve observability for financial applications in a zero-code manner by combining eBPF and WebAssembly. The floor consists of two process, agent and server. An agent is deployed on each Kubernetes node, virtual machine, or environmental server, responsible for collecting metrics and chasing data from all application process on that server. The server runs within a Kubernetes cluster, providing services such as agent management, data labeling, data storage, and data query. Using eBPF and WebAssembly to trace business protocol, the first step is to capture the protocol data. Deflow agent utilize eBPF UProb and USDT hook to capture data from user space functions related to SSL, TLS, HTTP2, HTTPS, customer encryption, and CAM correction protocols. Deflow agent also utilized eBPF KBLOB and TracePoint hook to capture data from kernel space functions. Additionally, it can capture non-encrypted and non-compressed protocol data, such as HTTP1, MySQL, customer, and other protocols, by leveraging BPF's FPAC on the LibrePack for capturing network interface data. Once the data capture is successful, Deflow Agent will utilize its pipeline to parse the captured protocols. The first step is protocol recognition. For passing the application protocols, Deflow includes a rich set of passes built in to decode standard protocol such as HTTP, gRPC, MySQL, Redis, DNS, and more. For business protocol, Deflow can leverage WASM plugin to achieve protocol passing. 
This allows for implementing support for uh, private protocol like TSA and KRPC. Due to the diversity of business needs, business protocol often lack standardization. Deepflow offers the flexibility to utilize WAS plugins for passing various business protocol, including port buffer, JSON, XML, and more. By combining attributes from application protocols and the business protocols, such as the request path and the business ID, and leveraging various forms of observability, including map, metrics logging and tracing, Dflow enables the local observability for financial applications. The mobile banking business of a certain company is gradually migrating to the cloud. Both the frontend have been fully modularized into micro services deployed in a Kubernetes environment. The integration of the backend channel database zone and ESB is also undergoing virtualization. However, the core zone is still running on mainframe. During the cloud migration process, Deepflow has been introduced to meet the requirement of regulatory compliance and business stability. By utilizing WASM plugins, Deepflow has the ability to customize protocol passing. It can pass commonly used protocols in the Kubernetes microservice framework, such as HTTP and JSON or gRPC on the product buffer. Additionally, it can also pass specific protocols used in the financial sector, such as XML. In a complex architecture, the local observability has been achieved for mobile banking. The presentation slides showcase the source map of the mobile banking business, illustrating the calling relationships. In case of any service exception within the business, they are visualized by highlighting them in red, emphasizing the location of the problem and quickly identifying the bottleneck point. You can view the golden metrics of each service in the mobile banking business using a service list. This allows for a quick understanding of the performance, availability, and health status of each service. By combining it with the service dependency topology, historical curve, and multi-dimensional statistic analysis capabilities, you can further focus on bottleneck in the upstream and downstream time period more granular dimensions. The request logging will record the attributes of each business request, such as the host, business ID, and other relevant information. Additionally, various tags will be used to indicate the aspect of the request. This attribute can be filtered and grouped to flexible analyze business data. The global transaction IDs will be mapped into the trace ID field by leveraging this trace ID in conjunction with eBPF. The local distributed tracing can be implemented. The flame graph consists of two types of spans, system span and network spans. And system spans are collected using eBPF and encompass both business-related spans as well as spans related to infrastructure, such as DNS, MySQL, Redis, and other infrastructure components. Network spans are collected from network traffic using BPF. These spans cover network forwarding paths, components such as IP tables, IP wires, OVS, link bridge, and other similar components. The flame graph can be utilized to quickly identify and pinpoint bottleneck issues in the application system and network. 
deflow using eBPF on the web sampling in a dialog code approach to address business stability and the monetary needs. During the migration of financing applications to the cloud, it enables prices for triage to ensure the stability and the reliability of financing applications. Due to the limited time, many details have been omitted in this presentation. If you are interested in DFLOW, you can follow the DFLOW project on GitHub for more information. Thank you. Thanks for sending us that talk, Casey. Uh, next up, we have Nikola Grusevsky. I hope I haven't mangled your name too badly, Nikola, uh, from Grafana Labs. I've seen Nikola in the chat on Slack, so uh, hopefully he'll be ready to answer lots of questions that you might have about his talk called Lies, Damned Lies and Request Times. Hi there, my name is Nikola Gorchowski and I work on eBPF at Grafana Labs. This presentation is going to be about measuring HTTP response times and meeting SLOs. We're also going to talk about a bit about tooling and how some of the tools we currently use may be lying to us and finding other tools that are a bit more accurate. Now we're going to start by building a very simple REST service. It has only one route slash ping, responds between half a millisecond to five milliseconds. And in this case, we're going to build an application in Go with the open telemetry, traces SDK, manual instrumentation, simple as it gets. We're going to drive some load to this application using work too. But for load generator, really it doesn't really matter what you use. In this case, it could be even a cloud service like K6. So we have this application built. We've captured a bunch of metrics. And what we're seeing from the output on these metrics generated is what we should expect to see. Average response time about 1.5, 1.25 milliseconds, 99 percentile, 4 milliseconds, seems to match what we expected to see for an application that takes up to 5 milliseconds to respond. Now let's see what work to reported in this case. It's quite different and much, much more different. In fact, we have a 50th percentile that's 100 times more than what we expected from the metrics and what we saw from the metrics. And 99% of it is 50 times more. And what's going on here? Well, I wasn't being fully upfront about how I generated this workload for this service. I generated a constant load of 500 requests per second on a service configured to only handle about 50 requests per second. So I'm overwhelming the service. And so technically, what we measure with the open telemetry SDK in this case is the service time, not the response time. We never measure the time it takes for the request on the queue, the time it takes for it to get served. So really, the, the measurement starts here. But what happens before? So on a Linux system, what would happen is that when the request pin comes in, a lot of kernel stuff happens, kernel activity gets sysaccept for exits, TCP, RCP established gets called. And eventually, after all those TCP related uh, functions, we get to the go runtime, which creates a go routine for us. Now, go routine will eventually have to wait for an M, which is a worker thread, to go speak. And then that worker thread will have to wait for a processor to run off. And eventually, we get to run our pink handler. Now, this particular thing we saw, it's not only a Go problem. Most of the web frameworks out there written in various programming languages have the same issue. They have some sort of thread pools. They have queues in which requests wait to be served by those thread pools and so on. Now, fortunately for us, on systems, on Linux systems with eBPF, we can actually tap much lower level um, than our application. So we can tap at the kernel level. We can track functions like TCP, RCP, established, or we can 
track when the go runtime forks a new go routine for us to run a particular request. At Grafana, we built an OSS tool that does auto instrumentation of HTTP and gRPC services with eBPF to do exactly this. So if we use the eBPF on the service we saw before, this is the kind of data we'll get, which matches what we see from work two. Now the 50% is 130 milliseconds, the 99% is reporting about 250 milliseconds. Same workload, same application, different tool to generate the metrics. Now the timestamp's a bit higher because of how bucketing works with open telemetry. Now if we see a particular trace of this application, one particular request, we see that the majority of the time of this request spent was in queue rather than in processing, which only took about 2.5 milliseconds. So to summarize, collecting accurate production level metrics can be very tricky sometimes. We just saw an application that went overwhelmed, failed to correctly report that it's been overwhelmed and that actually response times are pretty bad. With low level instrumentation tools like eBPF, we can get much better outcomes because we can measure the things outside of the scope of the application. And finally, thank you for watching this presentation. Our project is open source. Feedback and pull requests are always welcome. You can also find us on the Grafana Lab community Slack at the channel eBPF. Thank you, Nicola. That was really interesting. And next up, we have Dom Del Nano from New Relic, who's going to tell us about reliably tracing TLS in user space with eBPF. Hello, eBPF Summit. I'm excited to talk to you today about reliable user space TLS tracing with eBPF. My name's Dom, and I'm an engineer at New Relic working on the Pixie open source project where we're working to tackle these interesting challenges. So before we get into TLS, I wanted to give Pixie an introduction. It's an eBPF-based observability tool for Kubernetes that provides full fidelity protocol traces between your microservices. The reason why Pixie needs to solve this TLS problem is because of how widely adopted it's becoming in today's environments. There's many, many monitoring and observability tools that have blind spots when data is encrypted, and we want Pixie to provide deep insight in these situations. So to roadmap out what we'll be discussing today, we're first going to go over TLS tracing and Pixie's initial implementation and how that runs into challenges with user space tracing. We'll then talk about our revamped implementation and revisit how that expanded our support to handle new applications and address the challenges. And then we'll also talk about what we think comes in the future. Moving on to TLS, we can see, uh, here's an example of how we trace a plain text application on the left-hand side. We can attach our BPF program di directly to the send and receive syscalls since the application is calling those directly with its payloads. On the right-hand side, we see an application that's using TLS. And so that same send and receive syscall layer already has encrypted data. So we need our instrumentation to occur at an earlier point in the data lifecycle. And so this is at the SSL write and SSL read function calls within the TLS library. So this shows that in order to handle these TLS use cases, we have to trace user space. Uh, it's unavoidable. However, tracing production systems comes with additional challenges. There's different types of linking for these libraries. There's a variety of popular libraries. And ideally, we could cover many of them with a single implementation. And even the way you use the library can also create challenges. And so what I'm trying to articulate is, is that having access to the plain text data isn't enough. When you're trying to debug production services, that tracing data needs additional metadata in order to be useful. The way that Pixie's initial form of TLS tracing address this 
is by using a socket FD to provide connection identity. The plain text protocol tracing has easy socket FD access because it's part of the syscall contract. However, if we look at the SSL write function signature, the socket file descriptor is not part of this. And so in order for Pixie to trace this, we actually walk user space data structures to access this FD. And that's contained within that first SSL struct argument. So this is where um, this user space data structure doesn't have a uh, stable interface. And so new versions of that library will break the tracing. And so I won't be able to dig into this in more detail, but my Tracing Summit talk later this month will be doing a deep dive on that as well. So what we realized as we started to support more use cases is that socket FD access at this user space layer is extremely challenging. And you know, the more applications we supported, we realized that we were fighting an uphill battle because we were just proliferating more offsets with very little stability guarantees. So as we looked to simplify this implementation, we realized that it helped to classify these. And there's two major categories. The first is BIO native. And BIO is a OpenSSL concept standing for basic input output, and it refers to how OpenSSL does IO. And so BIO native is where OpenSSL performs the socket IO for you. And this is the case where the SSL struct that we were walking will have its socket file descriptor populated. The second case is custom BIO, which is where OpenSSL is used for encryption exclusively, and the application handles IO itself, usually in an asynchronous fashion. As we dig into these use cases more, um, we can see the difference at how they work. And so Pixie's existing form of TLS tracing worked with this left-hand side. And so what we felt as we classified these and looked at them in more detail, we felt that there were some assumptions we could make about the call stack that could help us uh, get away from the unstable user space interface and back to our stable syscall interface. So in this BIO native case, all of the SSL write and SSL read calls call send and receive. And we felt that there was an opportunity here for us to pass the socket file descriptor back from the syscall layer to our user space tracing layer. So to reiterate that, we wanted to be able to assume that socket syscalls occur while these functions are on the stack. And that would provide an opportunity for us to pass a socket FD from the syscall to the user space tracing on the U return probe. And so by allowing us to use this stable interface, we would be able to remove our reliance on user space offsets and avoid ongoing maintenance of supporting new offsets as they changed for new versions. Now, this idea really relies on our assumptions about the call stack being correct. And as we investigated this, we were concerned that it was possible for unrelated IO and syscalls to occur while these libraries are on the stack. So as part of this implementation, we built a standalone integrity checking mechanism that later became a piece of the TLS tracing to verify if when these syscalls occur, that the file descriptor is always the same. Because for example, something like buffered writes are okay, where the syscall is called multiple times for the same file descriptor, but we didn't want to associate plain text data with different file descriptors. And so we've run that check in production for five months and we've identified five programs that violate this assumption. Um, we also see it happen in a very small percentage of clusters and a small percentage of the overall connections. And so because this isn't occurring randomly for a large number of programs, we believe that this assumption is holds true and that uh, while we need to filter out some of these violations, that overall uh, this call stack mechanism can be relied on. So now that we've talked about it at a high level, I wanna walk you through how the tracing works and the BPF probes that occur. We're gonna imagine we have a service that queries a database over a TLS connection. And so when the query is sent, 
SSL write will get called. This will trigger our first probe, which will store an entry in a BPF map, which the key will be the current PID TGID, and the value will be an invalid FD Sentinel value. From there, write syscalls will occur. And our uh, second BPF probe is gonna check to see if that PID TGID exists, which will validate that a user space function is on the stack. And if it is, it will take its, sys or its socket FD and update the BPF map with it. From there, the syscall will return. And then finally, we will have our SSL write return probe trigger and we will check this same PID TGID key again. And if it is no longer that Sentinel value, we will send the socket FD and the plain text to a perf buffer and Pixie's user space component will take things from there. So I hope this shows at a high level how um, we, our design allows us to remove the unstable user space interface from the picture and uh, really simplifies the solution. So now that we've seen the solution in detail, I want to talk about how our tracing coverage changed and also things that we are looking for for the future. Here we can see that the initial implementation covered OpenSSL 1.1.0 and 1.1.1. OpenSSL v3 had potential to be supported, but required figuring out those user space offsets and making code changes to apply them. The redesigned implementation covers all of these changes with no additional code changes. So it vastly simplifies our maintenance and also gives us broader support. Future versions of OpenSSL will work out of the box. In addition to that, we were able to trace boring SSL and OpenSSL statically linked. This is something that the initial implementation could not handle. Boring SSL follows a rolling release style and as a result, it's difficult to apply memory offsets because there is no versioning information available. And so our redesigned implementation removes that from the picture and handles this use case transparently. There's additional use cases Pixie supports, but it relies on application specific implementations. And these all fit in that custom BIO bucket. So hopefully this gives you a high level overview of how our tracing has been broadened and with reduced maintenance, but there are still these BIO, custom BIO cases that we'd like to tackle in the future. So summarizing, I mentioned that we have this custom BIO use cases that we'd like to tackle in the future. Another area of expansion would be handling statically linked cases where the symbols are completely stripped. Our redesigned implementation can handle cases like this, but we don't actually know where the functions exist in memory, and so we can't attach our BPF probes to it. It's a tough problem to solve, but I think there's a lot of value in investigating that. And with that, I'd like to thank you for attending my talk, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for that one. It's definitely stimulated lots of questions. I see lots of uh, questions in there, particularly about uh, KTLS. So I think Dom's going to be busy answering those in Slack. And meanwhile, we will move on to a talk about a tool that I've used before, and I'm sure some of you will be familiar with it, called Inspector Gadget. So please welcome Mauricio Vasquez Bernal to tell us about it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this presentation. I'm Mauricio. I work as a software engineer at Microsoft. In today's presentation, I will be introducing the Spectre Gadget project. I will do a quick demo about that. Then I will be talking about a new feature that we are implementing that we call containerized gadgets. Again, another demo about that. And finally, I will be presenting or speaking the future plans that we have for the project. Right, so what is Inspector Gadget? Inspector Gadget is a framework or tool for inspecting and debugging Kubernetes containers and Linux host. It was initially inspired by BCC and we provide different tools that we call 
gadgets. So the idea is that each of those tools, each of those gadgets is focused on debugging, troubleshooting, or observing a specific part of the system. For instance, we have one gadget for tracing DNS requests. We have another gadget for tracing new processes that are being created, and so on. The, the motivation behind Inspector Gadget is that with eBPF, we are able to collect a lot of low-level data from the kernel, but then this we need to find a way to provide this information in a clear way to the user. So in Inspector Gadget, we take the low-level data from the kernel, we enrich that information, and we provide that to the users by correlating that with high-level concepts like Kubernetes container and so on. So for instance, when a process is created, we are able to say what is the PID of the process, what is the name of the command, but then we are also able to say what is the container pod namespace where that event happened. We support Kubernetes, this by using a kubectl plugin. So we have our kubectl gadget plugin. The idea there is to provide an interface that is very similar to other kubectl uh, commands. And then for Linux, we are able also to trace containers and local processes there. We provide a binary call IG. So what are the different gadgets that we provide? So we, we have some built-in gadgets. We divide those gadgets into different categories. Right now we have six categories. And um, yeah, just to mention some of them, we have the advice category. So those are gadgets that collect information and based on that, they are able to suggest uh, system configurations. For instance, uh, a set com profile. We have profilers, those gadgets observe the system and return a statistics on the system. For instance, the latency of the block IO operations. We have a snapshot, those report the current status of the system. One example is to print the system or the processes that are being run in the, in the host. Another category that we have are the toppers. Those are for printing a sort list of information. For instance, the TCP connections ordered by the one with the most traffic. And finally, we have tracers. Those are like the more standard ones. And those print, those provide a string of events. A DNS request was sent, a process was created, and so on. We also have other gadgets. We have a script. This is like BPF trace, so a domain specific language for inspector gadget. And we also have trace loop. This is very similar to a stress, but in this case, it's faster. OK, so let me show you a quick demonstration about the built-in gadgets that we have in Inspector Gadget. So I'm going to, I'm going to trace, for instance, the new processes that are created on, on the cluster. So in order to do so, I will just uh, create a, a container so I can uh, issue some comments. So for instance, let's do scat, let's pink. So as you can see on the top, we have information about that. So we have that a cat command was executed. We have the arguments from that. And in the right part of the terminal, we have all those level details like the PID, the parent PID, the command and so on. But on the left part of the screen, we have the Kubernetes related information like the node, namespace, pod, container, and so on. Mm, for instance, we can check all the files are being opened in the cluster. So by passing this dash A, we are saying that we are going to trace all namespaces. So we print all the activity that is happening on the class. I show you the current status of the project, but this is something that we are changing. While we were thinking about how to support external gadgets, we realized that we could be able to implement a more generic and flexible mechanism to run gadgets. So this is why we, we are calling containerized gadgets. So the idea here is to implement a mechanism for packaging and distributing eBPF programs. We could say that this is a container-like runtime for eBPF programs. The whole idea is to provide something that users are already familiar with. So for instance, users are very familiar with containers, dockers, 
and so on. So the mechanism that we are providing is very familiar to that. The idea is that we take the VPF programs, we put those VPF programs into an image, we push that image to a container registry, and then the users will be able to pull and run those images by using Inspector Gadget. This support was initially inspired by Bumblebee. So how does it work from the technical point of view? When, when the user wants to run a gadget, the Inspector Gadget pulls the gadget image. In there, we have the different eBPF programs and other files. We load and attach those eBPF programs into the kernel. And based on a naming convention that we have, we are able to understand if the different maps in the eBPF programs are of interest for us. So if there are some maps that are used to output the events, we read those maps, we get the events, and then we enrich, format, and print, and print those events to the user. I think the easiest way to show you how it works is by doing a demonstration. So right here I have uh, the eBPF code of a gadget. This is the trace open. This is based on the open snoop tool from BCC. So here we import some header file with some type definition and helper functions that we provide in Inspector Gadget. This is the definition of the event that we are going to send to user space. And this is the map that the BPF programs will be using to send those events to, to user space. So we have this print underscore prefix. This allows Inspector Gadget to identify that this is a map that we should be reading to get the events. Uh, and right, here we have all the logic, the different eBPF programs and so on to get and populate the events from the kernel. The other thing that we have is a definition file. So this file describes the different fields that are provided by the gadget. Actually, this is something that is mandatory right now, but we are working to make this optional. Okay, so we can compile the eBPF program by running make. This will just use clan and we'll create the eBPF object. And then we can use the build command to put that eBPF object and the definition file I showed you before into a container image. So this is the command that we have to run. And yeah, right now it only accepts the compiled eBPF object, but we are also working so that clan is directly invoked by this image build command. Uh, if I do IG in my list, we can see the different gadgets that we have available on my system. I can push that to a container registry, and then I can run that. So in order to run that, this is very similar to the Docker run or to the kubectl run command. So this is the, the name of the image. And yeah, so if I use this, this is only going to capture the events from my container. So as you can see a lot of events there, but yeah, all the things that I show you before are also supported there. So I could show all the events from all namespaces and so on. What are the features plans that we have for Inspector Gadget? Well, the first thing that we are working on is to implement all the built-in gadgets that we have as container I gadgets. We are also thinking about providing the possibility to have custom user space code. We know that there are some gadgets that require some custom user space logic, not only BPF programs. We are working to implement that. And additionally to that, the idea is to create more integrations for inspector gadget like supporting as different exporters for logs like for logs also prometheus or having an api and additionally to that we are implementing a more robust arrangement supporting other things like systemd and so on and right that's it Thank you for that great talk, Mauricio. And I can see lots of uh, love for Inspector Gadget uh, coming up in the Slack channel. And I, our next talk is another tool that I'm sure lots of folks watching will have used, which is BPF Trace. 
we have Alistair Robertson from Meta telling us about making BPF Trace more powerful. Hello, everyone. My name is Alistair Robertson, and I'm the creator and co-maintainer of BPF Trace. Today, I'm going to be talking about the ongoing work to make BPF Trace into the ultimate tracing tool for Linux. Because while well, today BPF Trace is great for writing quick and simple scripts for most use cases, there are still times where it's necessary to create wrappers around BPF Trace or to fall back to other more complex tools such as BCC or libbpf. So the question is, what can we do to make BPF Trace suitable for these more advanced use cases? Well, we're enabling tracing for cases that were simply impossible before by adding new functionality and adopting new BPF features. We're exposing advanced options to writers of BPF trace scripts. We want to keep the simple defaults, but allow people to override them as much as possible. And finally, we're making it easier to write complex scripts through extensions to the BPF trace language. So we want, we'll start at the beginning today with an example of one of the BPF features that we've recently adopted, the problems we found, and how we've worked around them. The scenario here is that we want to trace a containerized application, specifically one which is running inside a PID namespace. Symbolication in BPF trace is typically done by recording a PID alongside an address. However, when the target application is running inside a PID namespace, we start to have problems. The standard BPF helper for getting a PID, BPF get current PID tgid, always returns PIDs as seen from the root or init namespace. This is fine as long as BPF trace is running in the root namespace. But if BPF trace is also running in the container, then we're not able to correctly look up the process using a non namespaced PID. Enter a second namespace aware helper, BPF get ns current PID tgid. So this one returns a PID as seen from the current namespace and works as long as BPF trace and the target are both in the same namespace. This means that it doesn't work for tracing containerized applications from the root namespace. Unfortunately, there's no single BPF helper which is able to work in all scenarios. And the workaround that we've put in place is to simply switch between the two helpers based on whether BPF trace is running in the root namespace or not. Now, there are still some more cases for which we can do nothing. When BPF trace is in a PID namespace, but not the same namespace as the target application. Ideally, there would be a single BPF helper which was able to translate PIDs between namespaces and that we could use all the time. But for now, our workaround to switch between the two helpers is sufficient to cover the most common use cases. Now, very quickly, in terms of making it easier to write BPF trace scripts, one of the major new features coming to BPF trace is user defined functions. This adds a new syntax for enabling code reuse in larger scripts. Work is ongoing with an initial implementation based on inlining and plans to soon use BPF subprograms. And finally, I want to briefly mention some of the plans for userland tracing. I hope to make tracing userland applications with BPF trace just as easy as it is to trace the kernel. Some of the ideas for this are to increase the amount of debug data that we use to better understand the data structures and stack traces that we might come across. I also hope that the ongoing work to add user-defined functions and BPF trace, sorry, and BPF subprograms can serve a secondary purpose of allowing us to more easily interface with libbpf programs, which, which we could call into to get stack traces from higher level languages. So that's all I've got for you in this very brief overview today. To find out more, check out our website, our repository on GitHub, join the IRC channel, or come along to our monthly virtual office hours. Thank you all for listening, and I will now be available for any questions in the Slack channel.
Thank you, Alistair, so much for sending in that talk. And we are now going to go to another quick break. We will be back at five past. So you have just enough time to, you know, move around a bit, grab a snack. Maybe yours, like mine, will have started disguising themselves as bees. All right, we'll see you at five past. Hey, welcome back. <clears throat> Our first talk in the next section, which is going to be talking about security with eBPF, <coughs> excuse me, 
is going to be by a really good friend, Kyle Quest, who's going to be talking about minifying containers with Slim Toolkit and eBPF leveraging Tetragon a file system activity tracing. Welcome, Kyle. Let's see how we can use the power of eBPF and Tetragon to minify container images with Slim Toolkit. But first, a bit of background. What is Slim Toolkit? How does it minify container images? And what's the use of eBPF and Tetragon? Slim Toolkit allows you to inspect, minify, and debug your container images. It uses static and dynamic analysis to understand the application in the container and its dependencies. For dynamic analysis, Slim Toolkit creates a temporary container and it observes its behavior when it interacts with the container using different types of probes. With the original design, the observations are made from within the temporary container. It's very portable and convenient, but the overhead is sometimes too much under certain conditions. That's where eBPF and Tetragon can help, but we need a different sensor for that. Let's see what a sensor might look like and how we can build it. This diagram outlines an eBPF-based sensor design. The most interesting part is the hooks that collect the telemetry. Slim Toolkit needs to know about the files used by the container. So we need the hooks that expose file names. Usually it's the tracing hooks. They're designed to read the kernel execution state. TracePoint, KProbe, and F entry hooks are the three main types of tracing hooks that can be used. Tracing points are the most stable and portable way to get the data. They are predefined hooks in the kernel, so we'll focus on those. There are two main implementation options to build a system sensor. Creating one from scratch, that's a lot of work. And building a sensor on top of an existing tool. We'll focus on that. There are several eBPF based tools. Tetragon stands out for a number of reasons. It has support for Docker and Kubernetes. It has solid eBPF code. It has flexible filter and action logic in eBPF in the kernel. Don't need to do everything in the user space. It supports eBPF compile once run everywhere. So no more kernel header installation headaches when you deploy and it's highly programmable. Let's learn more about Tetragon and its main components, how to configure it and how to get the data out. Tetragon provides runtime observability and enforcement for system activity using eBPF. This diagram is not complete, but it captures the main processing flows in Tetragon to configure it and to get events from it. Tetragon is configured with tracing policies. They describe what system components to hook, what kind of events to generate, and what actions to perform. There are four ways to configure tracing policies. Command line flags, not very flexible. kubectl, Kubernetes specific. Tetra CLI, more appropriate for ad hoc activities. API, that's the best option to integrate. Based on the provided tracing policies, Tetragon creates sensors that abstract the client side eBPF logic. Sensors use a set of generic pre-compiled eBPF programs that are configured with the data from tracing policies. Note that each hook spec in your tracing policies gets a separate eBPF program instance. So if you define a lot of hooks, it takes a long time for all of those eBPF program instances to load, which is the case for the Slim Toolkit integration. The eBPF programs in the kernel post the relevant events to their ring buffers, and the event observer in Tetragon agent reads them. There are three ways to get the events from Tetragon. Tetra CLI, event exporter, uh, exporter not enabled by default, and API. And the API is the key for the integration. So let's explore how we can use it. The Tetragon API is a gRPC API exposed over TCP on local host by default. You'll need to tweak the API configs a bit to make it usable. You can use Unix sockets um, instead of TCP, but it's harder to configure uh, in containerized environments. There are 
many API calls, but the most important calls for the integration are the calls to add tracing policies and to get events. Let's see what the calls look like. First is the call to configure tracing policies. Right now, we have to provide a blob of YAML with all of your configurations. Hopefully later, the structure will allow you to specify the config fields directly instead of using an opaque object. So what does this YAML look like? Here's a partial snippet for the tracing policy YAML. Looks like a Kubernetes resource manifest. Here we configure a syscall trace point for the most common system call used when you open files. We're configuring the trace point that gets called when you enter the system call, which is why the trace point call, uh, the trace point name is called sysenteropenet. There's also sysexit uh, openet. There are a lot of other hooks configured, but this is a good example. Note the org section for the hook. What is it and why is it needed? You have to spe uh, specify the trace point parameters you want to see. In this case, we want to see the open file names. What is index six though? It is the zero based index of the trace point parameter we need to have in the generated event. How do we find it? Let's find out. You can discover the trace point parameter information by reading the format file for the trace point. In this example, we read the format file for the syscenter open at syscall trace point. We care about the format section here. The first field represents in index zero. You keep going until you find the parameter you need. In our case, it's index six, where we have the file name to open. We also need to specify the condition when we need to get the trace point information. And that's done using the selector section. If you don't specify it, you'll get events for the entire system. Ideally, there'd be a way to select specific container we need to monitor. There's an indirect way to do it using process IDs or namespaces. Unfortunately, you don't have the main process ID for the container until it's running. And for Slim Toolkit, it's too late because it'll miss important file system activity when the container starts up. So the solution is to specify the process IDs Slim Toolkit doesn't need. Here it shows that it doesn't need the host events and it doesn't need events from the Tetragon engine container. Its process ID is passed when the policy is configured. Now let's see how we get the events from Tetragon. With the get events call, you get a response that allows you to read one event at a time where you decide what to do with it based on its type. The types correspond to the hook types uh, you configure in the tracing policies. Here we have the main event fields used for the integration. The most important field is the file name argument field. The code is saving all string arguments uh, there. Argument labels didn't work for the uh, trace points uh, with the version I used for the integration, but they did work for K probes though. The other fields provide additional context information. For example, the Docker field um, from the process section provides the container ID for the container where the event happened. It's used for additional client-side filtering to make sure it's getting events only from the target container. Now that we covered the different components, let's see how it all fits together. The system sensor-based design doesn't have sensors embedded in the temporary containers Slim Toolkit creates. The new system sensor component is included in the main app itself. It has a, an engine controller component that's responsible for provisioning and configuring the Tetragon agent container. The engine controller is also used to get the Tetragon events. Once Slim Toolkit is done monitoring the target container, it asks the system sensor to generate a report that describes the composition and the activities for the target container. This report is passed to one of the image builders to create a new minified image. So what are the key takeaways? Tetragon isn't just a standalone tool. It's a great programmable eBPF toolkit. Not having to compile the eBPF programs during deployments makes it significantly easier to use Tetragon. The tracing policy configuration language is a bit low level and it can benefit from better hooked function and trace point argument support. The API to configure eBPF tracing policies is basic, 
but usable. The current selector capabilities and tracing policies are sufficient to support the Slim Toolkit use cases, but it will be nice to have container ID or C group name based selectors at some point. Thank you and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Welcome back. Thank you, Kyle, for that awesome talk. Kyle is active in the chat. So if you have questions about that or any ideas or comments that you'd like to share with him, definitely throw it into Slack chat. The next talk that we have up is by Mike Zandi from BlackBerry. He's going to be talking about detecting and preventing stack pivots in Linux userland programs using eBPF. My name is Mike Zandi. I'm going to be talking about some research that my teammate Anthony Blanton and I did on BlackBerry Silence's applied research team on detecting and preventing stack pivots on Linux using BPF. I'm going to cover some background intro information, talk about our proof of concept design, some testing and benchmarking we did, and then wrap up with some final thoughts. As far as scope, we're only going to be talking about Linux AMD64 architecture systems, and we're only trying to protect user land, not the kernel. Motivation is, can we use BPF to stop exploits as they happen instead of just alerting? And I want to give a shout out to Tetragon for essentially answering yes and taking a more general approach than we did. I haven't run it myself, but having looked at the code, uh, it's pretty impressive. So shout out to everyone who's worked on it. Also, the closest thing I could find in prior existing research to the approach that we wound up taking uh, was used in RopGuard, research from about 10 years ago, but that only focused on Windows. However, it's been implemented in Windows Defender nowadays, so shout out to that research as well. Reading between the lines, the goal is we want something that we can apply on a system as it is without having to rebuild software. Uh, so what's a stack pivot? Well, I'm going to assume that we're generally familiar with the stack. It's a very popular target to get code execution if you have memory corruption in a process. But modern, uh, modern protections mean that you can't just inject shell code and jump to it anymore. So most modern exploits that take this approach use return-oriented programming, where you recombine existing snippets of code in the program to accomplish whatever it is you're trying to do. I made some bad diagrams to explain this. On the left is the stack as we expect it to be in normal operating conditions. The middle is the stack when there is a ROP payload that fully resides on the stack that is executing. And on the right, we have a ROP payload that uses a stack pivot where the stack pointer is changed to point to the heap or wherever else the full ROP chain is. So BPF seems promising for this. We can instrument the kernel safely. Cori means we have a much simpler way of building and distributing whatever we wind up with as compared to building for a dizzying array of kernels if we used a, a kernel module approach. The send signal helper means we have enforcement, so we can kill a process instead of just alerting about it. And the situation of a stack pivot should be simple enough that we can detect it within BPF program restrictions. So what design did we wind up running with? Well. The situation we're trying to detect is that some user land program gets exploited. The stack pointer gets updated to no longer point at the stack. And at some point, it calls syscalls like execve to do something malicious. So if we can track every task's legitimate stack, where it's supposed to be, uh, attached to important syscalls like execve, and when those syscalls are hit by user land programs, check that the stack pointer still is pointing into the stack. We should be able to detect this and kill the process when it happens. But there's some issues here. On Windows, this is easy because the thread information block gives you this information, and you can just look at the stack base and stack limit fields to determine where the stack is. But Linux doesn't really closely track the stack quite like that, and it doesn't even really have a well-defined notion of where a user land program stack is supposed to be. So we have to do some homework. The three cases we saw in practice broke down like this. Uh, the first one we called the system stack. 
every process has this. The initial thread in a thread group uh, is given the stack by the kernel, and the kernel manages it, grows it, and things like that, and saves the initial address of it in a kernel data structure. So this is pretty easy. We can just look up what VMA backs that address, and then check that the stack pointer still is in that VMA. The second case is for multi-threaded programs. To create a thread in Linux, you call the clone or the clone 3 syscall, and when you're creating a new thread, you need to provide a new SP parameter that tells the kernel where the stack pointer is going to be starting off for this new thread. But the kernel doesn't memory that doesn't manage that memory for you at all. It's all up to you, the user, which in practice means that a library or framework that you're using is doing it for you. In the case of P threads, it just allocates some fixed region of memory with MMAP uh, and then uses that as the stack for that thread. So for this case, if we can catch these regions uh, as the threads are started when they're first created, then we just can keep that information in a BPF map to look up later to see whether or not the stack pointer still is in the memory region, the, the region of memory it should be in. The third case is a bit tricky because Golang just kind of does its own thing. The user stacks are dynamically managed so they can grow, shrink, or be relocated, but they're allocated on the Go runtime heap, which is allocated using MMAP hints. So for this case, our heuristic is just that we check the stack pointer for this hint format, and if it matches, we decide this looks like it's a Golang program and it's probably OK. So as far as like a top-down view of this design, the heart of it is kind of this uh, tracked stack regions BPF map that we keep consistent using a few different BPF programs attached to like fork or the exec VE return. Other BPF programs are attached to things like execve, where they can check the stack pointer against both this BPF map and our other heuristics. And if it looks malicious, then we always send an alert up to user space, but optionally can also kill the process using BPF send signal. So for some light testing and benchmarking, here's how it seems to fare. Uh, we set up a simple Kubernetes cluster with two nodes, a worker node and a control node. We had traffic pointing to the next cloud on this. We had an internal Docker registry. We had BusyBox and Fronix test suite and a container for our proof of concept all running on this one worker. As far as benchmarks, um, so I think these are a bit representative. Apache, and, uh, Apache responding to requests and compiling the Linux kernel saw 5 to 10% slowdown. Postgres was negligible, kind of surprisingly. Um, but the worst case was the micro benchmark of creating threads, which was over twice as slow or over 100% over as slow, uh, which I think speaks both to how lightweight creating threads is on Linux, but also to the fact that this proof of concept, uh, we didn't optimize it at all, really. And it still had a lot of debug print statements in it. So my personal takeaway is that this five to ten percent overhead for typical workloads can probably be brought down quite a bit and i would call it like a worst case scenario a bit more importantly to me i wanted to make sure we had no uh no false positives because if we want to automatically kill processes that look like they're being exploited on a cluster if we have any false positives then we risk knocking over a cluster for typical benign behavior as far as the breakdown, we had 13 days of light usage on this cluster, and mostly we saw events we considered OK, where it was either the system stack or the thread stack, and a close second of events that we decided were coming from a Golang application, which we we're running Kubernetes, we we're running traffic, that's expected. We had what we called ancient thread events, where a thread was running and started before we were loaded, so we currently didn't have a way to determine if it was legitimate or not. But most importantly to me, we had no false positives. So my, my final thoughts from this uh, are that this can detect stack pivots. We did test this very early. Um, our test program just allocates a ROP chain on the heap, pivots the stack to it, and exploits itself, which is contrived. But it makes sure we can tell the difference between the stack and not the stack. Um, some false negatives. The one false negative this approach can't get around is that if an attacker pivots elsewhere in the stack, this isn't granular enough to detect that. You would need a different approach. The current implementation also has two holes that we can close. If an attacker can control an allocation, 
then they can make their shell code look like it's coming from Golang. Um, we can fill, we, we can close this by implementing some research we'd already done on determining if a, if a binary is a Golang binary or not. So, uh, secondly, if we uh, we we don't currently have a good way to protect threads that exist before we do, but I think a trust on first use approach would handle this case pretty well. Um, besides that, my takeaway is that this approach can work and it's very beneficial that it can uh, be applied to systems as they are. Um, as long as you have a heuristic that can capture the complexity of real world software without being so complicated that the overhead is unreasonable, which I think speaks to this, the, the other big takeaway which is that optimization is absolutely necessary for this to work because blocking one exploit technique is not very impressive with this kind of overhead. You need to get it down significantly so that you can be blocking a wide array of exploit techniques and really be protected. So that's all I've got time for. I'm going to leave this slide up for a couple seconds so that you all have our emails if you'd like to contact us. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope the rest of the conference is great. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Michael is active in the chat, so if you would like to ask him some questions and and dig into a little bit more of the research, he is available for that chat for for those questions. Um, thank you very much for joining us. And our next talk is going to be how to use eBPF as a solution to observe and optimize applications for endpoint security. Brought to us by Gaitha from Elastic. Hi everyone, my name is Geeta. I am a Senior Solutions Architect at um, Elastic. Today I thought I'd spend some time discussing about the EB eBPF solutions that can be used in observability space and also for endpoint security, how you can potentially use the BPF-based um, code and also solution that can solve some problems in the endpoint security space. Let's get started. So. If you're aware of uh, how monitoring works and how observe in the observability space, there are three main pillars. One is APM, logs, and metrics. So these three will, will essentially help you to create a, a modern observability solution, right? But um, the way we have traditionally done instrumentation is um, pretty invasive. If you aren't adding instrumentation um, manually, APM um, will insert itself into the code and it gets recompiled. This type of deployment can result in all sorts of issues that can bring down production environments. And eBPF can uh, provide a method to get observability data you need with instrumentation at all. And as a result, uh, far better safety can be um, acquired. And when you write eBPF code to run in the kernel, um, it is first compiled to the BPF bytecode using Clang, and then the bytecode is verified to make sure it's safe to execute. These strict verifications guarantee that machine code will not intentionally or accidentally compromise the Linux, uh, Linux kernels and that the BPF probe will execute a bounded number of instructions every time it is triggered. And that's how you can use eBPF under the hood to um, create a better observability solution. And uh, using BPF um, solution, right, you can solve some problems using this BPF compiler collection tools called as BCC tools. There's a link I'll give you at the end of this presentation to for you to check out. That's a good place to start um, when you look uh, um, under the hood um, of these BCC tools. Um, what these tools are doing is that they abstract away a lot of um, code needed to bootstrap eBPF um, and um, all these programs into the kernel, and they make them easily accessible via Python code. Um, I'll show you a bit of a code in the next slide, but uh, so some of the problems that you can solve with using these BCC tools in conjunction with EBP, eBPF are um, debugging disk IO latencies. Um, you can also track the slow file operations on Linux kernels with the help of BPF. 
And then you can summarize all these um, XFS operation latency uh, with the help of BPF and BCC tooling. And then you can also track um, kernel functions um, to find an issue with um, request and reduce it describes um, slowdowns. Now, eBPF um, does have some limitations. It, it, it cannot um, safely modify data. So the virtual machine that runs the eBPF code um, has read-only access to the variables in the code. And this is really important because otherwise, this could result in all sorts of unexpected problems. You can't really add tags or tracing IDs to, um, to, uh, the, to code dynamically in a practical way with eBPF um, as, you can, uh, as you can with an APM-based solution. So technically, it is possible but it involves patching um, memory. Uh, it's also unsafe and potentially has higher overheads. So therefore, APM agents and open telemetry, they still have a good place in the world today um, until those issues are resolved. Um, given that we need to add tracing information, logs and metrics data um, to our code uh, in the current day. So there's this uh, bit where um, there, there's, when you have when you have tracing that's being done under the hood and metrics that are being collected, you will have to generate a context and tie all of that data together. Um, this could be shifted over to eBPF. Um, and eBPF based agents um, for its performance benefits and for all the um, speed of summarization and because it has access to much more of the underlying systems with the help of this universal profiling and whatnot. Um, at the same time, you can use an eBPF based agent is what I'm trying to tell. At the same time, this eBPF could be used to gather deeper and more interesting information, um, security, network data, security data, and then data using about Kubernetes and other systems and services traditionally beyond the reach of APM. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about how uh, you are going to use this. Um, and then there's this bit of a Python code that you, you're seeing there. Uh, what's happening there is that you are basically um, printing a Hello World program uh, for each child process that is created from a terminal because it has a hook for this sys underscore clone, um, as you can see in man pages. Um, and if you, if you plonk this code into a Python file, um, you should be able to run it um, and you'll see that um, in another terminal, you start to uh, you'll start writing commands to see this hello world appear in each time you launch a process. So there are some interesting things going on in this program. First thing is um, you're defining a BPF program using a simple text. Um, this this is written in C, and then um, this is a shortcut for uh, kernel dynamic tracing via K probes. Um, if the C function begins with K probe, um, the rest is treated as a kernel function, as you probably know, um, to hook into, in this case, the sys clone function. Um, and there's a simple kernel facility of printf uh, for the, in order to use a common um, trace pipelining uh, function. And there's this trace print. Um, it's a BCC routine that uh, reads trace pipe and then prints out the output. Um, so this is what is, is, is essentially happening there uh, in this uh, Python program that is uh, eBPF based. Um, it's worth checking out the BCC tools um, in that uh, in the repository I'm going to give. Um, you'll have all the ways to help with um, so many problems that you'll experience, especially the ones that with traditional tools that have not been able to solve for you yet. Um, and there will you will see an integration of these tools coming up in your favorite observability solution soon. And then moving on to the endpoint security. Um, so the way in point security, you can do is uh, in Linux kernels or any kernels, uh, you can leverage eBPF for two use cases. First thing is host isolation. The other one is event sourcing with all the code uh, pertaining to all this. Uh, you know, you be you either use it for event sourcing, which can leverage BPF to source all the variety of security related events on Linux machine. Um, and, and it does all this by um, hooking into a variety of K probes and trace points and um, F trace hooks with uh, BB, BPF programs. If you are aware of that, you can leverage those um, hooks that exist already and leverage BPF to source the events for you and then analyze those events of this for endpoint security. And then for host isolation, um, you can perform uh, also similar um, cases uh, for host isolation. And then um, 
you would you should be able to achieve um, the level of uh, um, security that you desire for these Linux machines with the help of these K probes and trace points. Um, that's what I wanted to cover. And thank you so much for your opportunity, for this opportunity and for your time today. Bye. Thank you, Geetha, for that wonderful talk. Also, great shout out to BCC Tools. <clears throat> this brings us to the end of the eBPF for security section. In, in the next section, we're going to be talking about eBPF internals. But before that, we're going to go to a five minute break. So we'll see you all in just five minutes.
Hello and welcome back. While we were in the break, we got a really interesting comment or question rather from Jesse asking, is there a risk of destabilizing a system with the overuse or over instrumentation with eBPF? And have there been any benchmarks made for the worst possible setup? So I think that's a really interesting question. And I would love to hear like any horror stories or ideas about the kind of pathological use cases or pathological ways we could be overusing eBPF? Really great question. All right. It is now time to dive into some eBPF internals. And our next talk is from Vinay Kalkani from eBay. And it's going to be about analyzing the performance of XDP native, XDP generic, and TC hooks. Welcome to the session on performance analysis of TC versus XTP BPF hooks. My name is Vinay. Thank you for joining. The agenda for today is we will look at the eBPF hooks that are available to us at the network device layer, and then uh, also look at the difference between XTP, which is Express Data Path, and Linux Traffic Control hooks, the TC hooks. We will also take a close look at our use case of securing host processes, which motivated this whole exercise, followed by how we set up our performance test framework and then how we measured the performance and collected the CPU profile. We will look at an analysis of the CPU profile and uh, draw some insights that we uh, discuss some insights that, that we drew and then open it up for Q&A. So, this is your typical network stack. At the top, you have the application followed by a socket layer. As it sends uh, frames, it goes traverses a socket layer followed by TCP IP layer, the net device, and finally, the hardware NIC. In, in the choices that we have with regards to PPF programs that we can attach at the net device layer, we broadly have two choices, two categories. One is the Linux traffic control hooks, and then the other is the XTP hooks. Uh, traffic control hooks are available to us on both ingress and egress, whereas at this time, XTP hooks are available only on ingress. Uh, XTP hooks do have different modes. You have the offload mode, the driver mode, and the generic mode. In the offload mode, the BPF program runs in the NIC. In the driver mode, it's run uh, early as earliest possible point when the driver is invoked and handling the packet. And in generic, it's used mainly for testing, as we'll show discuss later. A key difference between the two is that you have uh, SK buff parameters being handled by TCPPF programs versus XTP buff, which requires buffers that are serialized. Let's look at our use case, which is about network micro segmentation for host processes. Well, consider this. You have, uh, this is a typical Kubernetes cluster. You have the master node and then you have the worker node. And in the master node, you have the kube API server running, and it, it connects to the kubelet, which is listening on TCP port 10.2.5.0. The reason for the API server to connect to kubelet on this port is uh, things like when you were to execute a command like kubectl exec to see what's going on in your container or kubectl logs. Now, there is no good reason for anybody else other than the Kube API server to be connecting to this port. Uh, if there is, then we need to know about it, but most likely it's some kind of a DOS attack. So what would you do? Well, eBPF to the rescue. So with eBPF programs attached to the NIC, we can inspect the packet way down way early and then determine if it's a legitimate packet, is the sender legitimate, and make a policy determination, a policy verdict on whether to allow that packet to go up the stack or drop it. So in this context, when we uh, were looking at the different places where we could attach the eBPF programs, we started wondering about the performance aspect of it. Is it better to do generic program? Is it better to do TC or XTP driver mode? and we needed some data to make our design choices. So our traffic setup, traffic test performance uh, test setup is very simple. It's two VMs running on a M2 Mac. 
Max, which is a pretty powerful system. We have the IPerf3 sender, which is sending at the max rate rate can. We, we're just using a single TCP uh, stream because uh, we just want to get numbers on uh, how they compare apples to apples in the same setup. So the sender sends traffic down the stack on this VM and it's received, the target is this VM on the right. And it's received by the NIC, it traverses up the stack. Now the programs that we attach here are doing nothing. They're dummy programs, they just return, okay, let it through. But what we do get from this is the overhead of just calling these programs. Is it more expensive to attach it here, here, or here? We get that information. So to run the traffic test, we use the iperf3 tool. And on the receiver, we it's really simple. We run it for 60 seconds. We we took we did three tries and then got the best and average of three. Uh, picked a random port, 23434, three, you could pick whatever you like, and uh, you send the logs to null so that you don't burn any kind of CPU or your CPU just logging, and that gives the network the most amount of CPU that it needs. On the sender, you specify the target, of course, the destination port, and 60 seconds, and well, the intervals, this is the interval of logging and time 60 seconds. And then the max is five gigs, five gigs because we were saturated, we were saturating it at two gig in our setup. Now to collect the CPU profile, profile information, we use profile BPFCC tool and we run it for 70 seconds. We start this tool just after after the IPERF receiver has started, but just before the IPERF sender is started. That way we get the CPU profile for pretty much the test that we are doing. And then we send it out to our out file. After you collected the CPU profile information, what you do is you go to this wonderful tool called Flame Graph that was created by Brendan and Greg. Uh, you get that and run the simple script with this command line and output it to this profile.svg file. And this is going to give you a visual of what's going on with your CPU during your test. Uh, let's look at some numbers. In our test, uh, as I mentioned before, we were using M2 Max. The VMs have eight CPUs, 16 gig of memory. We use the word IO PCI net device and uh, in shared networking mode. The kernel version used was 5150-78 on Ubuntu 22.04. And we used an MTU of 1500 bytes. It's a limitation of the bridge that we had. We didn't have time to work around that, but it didn't matter for our use case. Uh, the TCP buffers on the read and write were uh, one page, which is 4096 bytes. In all the tests, we saw CPU utilization around nine to 10%, which indicated that uh, the CPU was not pegged. There was plenty of CPU. And uh, the limitation was in whatever the network bandwidth we had through that bridge. Now, looking at the numbers, it's no surprise that without any eBPF program attached, we get uh, the best numbers so at 2.13 for the best of three tries and 2.12 is average. For XTP driver mode, you get 2.12 gig and 2.11 gig on average of three tries. And that's because this XTP program is in the way. It needs, there is a small cost to invoking that. Now that's followed by Linux TC, which is at 2.09 gigabits per second on the best of three tries and 2.087, which is really close followed by XTP generic mode, which has a fair amount of performance hit. You get 1.89 gigabits of the best of three tries with 1.87 as average. This, this difference between Linux TC and the XTP generic got us wondering, which is the reason why we profiled the CPU to find out what's going on. Now, when we look at the flame graphs, you kind of, it jumps at you. The Left-hand side is pretty similar. The right-hand side over here, these towers here, the skyline here looks a little different, looks pretty different. And when you look closely, this is the case of IRQ, which is the interrupt handler that's receiving packets. It's pretty small here, the number of samples you collect, but here it is fairly big. And if you zoom in closer, you look at this do X, and then we double click on that. We see, okay. So you have the IRQ sending the packet up, the receive, GRO receive, and then uh, SKB is allocated, and then do XTP generic receive. And then you have this pull tail, mem move, 
malloc, new slab, and then clear slab free. Okay, we kind of started. This is probably where our performance hit is coming from. There is a certain amount of overhead to using XTP in generic mode. In conclusion, XTP driver mode might be a good choice for the receive path to do network policy enforcement. The idea is that if you're going to have to drop a packet, do it before the OS resources are allocated. And we observed that uh, TC eBPF receive paths have a small overhead. XTP generic mode has an overhead, but it has its users. It's good for testing purposes. Uh, lastly, we have shared this the code and the results that we got from this simple test of ours on GitHub. Please take a look. Thank you. And we will be around for Q&A in the Slack channels. Thank you, Vinay. And next up, we have Usama Sakib, Sakib from Datadog speaking about eBPF reentrancy. Hello. My name is Osama Sakib, and I'm a software engineer at Datadog. Today, I will be discussing the issue of reentrancy in eBPF programs. So, what is reentrancy? Well, in this context, reentrancy is defined as a scenario where we have two eBPF programs running concurrently on the same CPU. What signals do we expect to see if reentrancy occurs? Well, for this presentation, we'll, we will be looking at two signals, k-probe misses and interleaved execution. Before discussing how these signals manifest due to reentrancy, let's take a step back and revise some of the execution guarantees provided by the kernel for eBPF programs. eBPF programs run the preemption disabled. As a quick aside, this is only true until version 5.7, after which eBPF programs use migrate disable instead. Regardless, the core point here is that eBPF programs do not disable interrupts from the processor. The implication of this is that in the execution of an eBPF program can be stopped midway. This is the core issue from which other complexities arise. So how do reentrancy and k-probe misses relate? Before we begin, uh, let's look at let's briefly look at how k-probes work. K-probes work by instrumenting an address with a debug trap. Uh, the kernel does not allow nesting of k-probes. If nesting is detected, then the kernel records a miss and moves on. Statistics regarding these misses are exposed via the sysfs through a file called kprobe underscore profile. So given this, how do kprobe misses happen? Well, one way is if we have a kprobe attached to a function which runs from within an interrupt context. The scenario here is that we have a kprobe triggered from a function which is running in user context. This k-probe is interrupted, and in the interrupt handle routine, another k-probe is triggered. At this point, the kernel will read a per CPU variable holding a reference to the current active k-probe context. If this reference is present, then that means nesting has occurred, and the k-probe and the kernel increments the k-probe missed counter. The handler is entirely skipped by simply single stepping over the instrumented instruction. I will briefly also mention that there is a second way that kpro misses can occur, which is not related to reentrancy. I refer to these as spurious misses because the handler itself is never skipped. Uh, the way this happens is when a fault occurs during the execution of a kpro handler, for example, a page fault due to the use of BPF pro user. Uh, the kernel, during the fault handler routine, the kernel increments the end missed counter. The implication of k-probe misses are application dependent. However, one, so for example, one implication could be map entry leak. Uh, this can happen when the life cycle of map entries is managed across multiple probes. Map entry leak can deteriorate map health over time. 
Another implication could be to accuracy for tracing applications since KPRO misses can lead to missed events. Next, we will discuss how interleaved execution can happen due to reentrancy. For this presentation, we will, be, we will specifically be looking at interleaved execution of eBPF programs attached to a socket filter. Again, the core issue over here is the fact that interrupts can happen and interrupts can happen and uh, stop the execution of, of an eBPF program midway. So as a starting point, let's take a look at, uh, let's revise briefly uh, some features of interrupt handling in the Linux kernel. Broadly speaking, interrupts are handled in three phases. The first two phases are immediate and run with interrupts from the processor disabled. The final phase is deferred and run with interrupts enabled. Software IQs are one example of a deferred execution mechanism within the Linux kernel. Software IQs again run with interrupts disabled and they're scheduled after a hard IQ or from a case soft IQ thread. So given this context, how does interleaved execution of socket filters happen? Well, socket filters can execute in both user context and interrupt context. On the transmission path, the socket filter executes in user context and on the receive path, the socket filter executes in an interrupt context. Therefore, a socket filter, for example, running in net RX soft RIQ can interrupt a socket filter running in a user context. Since the kernel does not provide any guardrails for nested execution of socket filters, we end up with interleaved execution of two instances of EBBF programs. One implication of this interleaved execution could be corruption of private per CPU data. Thank you. This is all I had to say about EBBF reentrancy. Thank you for listening. That was really interesting. I think a lot of people have learned something from that talk. Uh, in our last talk in this eBPF internal section, let's please welcome Dip Saikia and Nikhil Malik and their presentation about state synchronization of eBPF maps for high availability applications. Hello all, I am Deep from NetLogs and for today's talk, I am joined by my colleague, Nikhil Malik. We are going to talk about the fascinating topic of how to synchronize eBPF maps for each applications. So why do we need this state sync? As we all know, eBPF is being used in a lot of stateful network applications like filtering and load balancing. It becomes a necessity to synchronize the state of these applications when deployed in HA pairs. When we talk about state, it basically means the information stored in eBPF maps. And if we look back traditionally, net filter and IP tables infra were used for Linux stateful filtering and contract D daemon would be used for synchronization of IP table contract entries. But we are in a new world powered by eBPF, so let's explore. The most straightforward way to achieve this would be to traverse all elements of a map in a periodic fashion. But of course, it would be too costly from a compute perspective. It would also be very difficult to track the exact changes taking place in the map inside the Linux kernel. So we need a way to act on async notifications on map events. And here, eBPF comes to its own rescue. We took the approach of using KPROP notifications applied at kernel's eBPF table modification functions. And furthermore, notify the user space of these events using eBPF perf or ring buffer. And at the user space, we can then tie these events with well-known reliable messaging frameworks like gRPC to make the whole thing work. Before moving forward, there are a few implementation specific things we need to mention here and which the audience might find interesting. K-probes 
usually would grab events related to all eBPF maps inside the system. And this would cause a lot of churn. To reduce churn, the K-probe kernel side program further filters events based on map names. Map names can be passed to the kernel side program using a different set of eBPF maps. For our current use case, we are, however, using K-probes only for you know, hash entry points. Of course, it can be changed as per need. And one great thing about our implementation is that it is completely unaware of any map details or semantics. Hence, it can be reused by different applications. So the next question is, how does it fit into the bigger picture? We use this infra currently in another project known as LoxyLB, which is a eBPF based service LB for Kubernetes. It is used as an application agnostic sort of sidecar to synchronize eBPF maps on demand. There are a lot of resources online about this, which we have mentioned at the end of the talk. Next, we will talk about what kind of numbers we can expect from such a framework, and my colleague Nikhil will take it further. Thanks, Dee. Hello, everyone. I'm Nikhil from Networks. We took some performance measurements of LoxyLB with and without Sync Infra deployed in a single node cluster. Without Sync Infra, LoxyLB peaked at 232k connections per second, but we saw a dip of just 5% when we integrated it with the Sync Infra. Then we use network to benchmark connections per second and vary two metrics, page count and network threads. Initially, we saw some event drops, but it came to zero drops when we set the page count to 32k. These bottlenecks here are due to EPPF per buffer and its leader side implementations. Next, we compare two RPC infras to sync the connection entries to the peer. We observed that net RPC performance was better than gRPC. We intend to make these numbers better by doing some more optimizations along with integration with Kafka as well. This short video shows the synchronization of 50,000 concurrent sessions. Interested viewers can find the link to this video on the last slide. Over to you, Deep. Thanks, Nikhil, for explaining the performance numbers. They look interesting. Let's talk about future work. In future, we plan to make this whole infra auto-generate possibly by using Clang itself. And this would definitely help reduce a lot of boilerplate code for eBPF app developers. So we have come to the end of our uh, talk today. Thank you all for your time. There is a lot of development ongoing for the parent project, which is hosted at loxylb.io. So please go ahead and visit it. And recently it crossed 700 stars and 40K downloads. So please give it a star on GitHub and support our work if you like it. Thanks a lot. Let's put lots of emoji reactions into Slack to thank all of our speakers who put so much work into this deep dive eBPF internal section. We are going to take another short five minute break and then we'll be back for our last set of talks and some fun things as well. So we'll see you in five minutes.
Hey, everybody. Welcome back from the break. This next section is going to be on eBPF and operating systems. And to kick us off, we have Alan McGuire talking about BPF Tune, auto tuning Linux with eBPF. Hi, my name is Alan McGuire. I'm here to talk about auto-tuning Linux with eBPF. So the problem is the Linux kernel has a lot of tunables. Um, on a 6.4 kernel, we see about 1600 sys controls alone. And most of these reflect the, the reasonable fact that there's no easy right answer for a lot of aspects of configuration. Uh, within Oracle, we were seeing the same kind of tunable issues crop up repeatedly with the same tunables. And the general process was someone would file a bug, engineers with experience in those subsystems would post some suggestions for how to tweak those tunables, and these problems would go away. But we wanted to explore if there was a more systematic way to, to address these sort of problems. Now, BPF is interesting because it provides a very low overhead way to observe a system. And once you can observe, you can ask questions like, well, does a tunable need to be updated? And then you can also ask, when I've made that update, has it been effective? Um, what effects do we observe after making that tunable update? Do we need to undo the change or has it done the job for us? BPF also provides a way to change values at a fine grain, like a per socket level. So it's useful in that regard also. Um, to talk about BPF tune, probably the best way is to walk through the design principles to give a sense of what we were trying to do and how we were trying to do it. Um, the first key principle is making BPF tune pluggable. We started off addressing issues with a lot of networking tunables, which were where we were seeing a lot of issues and bugs being filed. But the aim was to make it easy to add new tuners. Um, the approach we took is to make tuners deliverable as shared objects. Um, those shared objects would have to implement three methods, an initialization method to set up our BPF programs and do any other setup work that's needed, a cleanup method to clean all that up when, when, when the tuner's finished, and an event handler method, which I'll describe in a minute. We also wanted to make the core BPF tune capabilities pluggable as well. So they're currently delivered in a BPF tune program um, or service. Now, because we've made those core capabilities, um, we've implemented them via library functions, the BPF tune program daemon is quite small. So the idea is by implementing those as a library, others can intermix those capabilities into their own products if they need to in the future. So we wanted to just make it maximally flexible in both regards. So when we look at the architecture, um, we'll describe the sort of flow of events. So we can see on the right-hand side, a set of BPF programs attached, which are interested in observing events related to TCP send buffer um, related issues. So we see one of the BPF programs has sent an event to the shared ring buffer, which BPF tune uses. And that event will have a tuner ID associated with it, in this case, the tuner ID of the TCP buffer tuner. And this allows us to then route the event to the TCP buffer tuner shared object and call its event handler method. And that event handler can then process that event. So in a case like this, it could be something like we're approaching the TCP buffer limit. You know, we've got to make a decision whether to increase it or not. So that, that's how information is kind of routed around um, within the framework. Another key principle is to minimize overhead. If this service is going to be running all, all the time, always on, we want to use F entry and F exit BPF probes because they're lower overhead than compared to K probes and K return probes. We also want to avoid high frequency events. So we don't want to trace a, a, a function that's going to be called million times a second or anything like that. Another key aspect is we don't want it to be some sort of opaque procedure running. Um, the aim is to use syslog to describe changes what changes we've made and what the rationale for making those changes was. So it's understandable to the administrator what's been done. Uh, BPF tune will also provide a summary and exit describing all the changes made. So you can kind of see over the lifetime of BPF tune, what tuning decisions have been made and what the rationales for those are. It's also key not to step on the administrator's toes. I mean, one of the design principles for BPF tune is most systems these days are hands off and don't have an administrator on the console. But if there does happen to be some administration activity going on, we don't want to all do that by auto tuning on top of it. So we again use BPF to detect those kind of outside modifications to the tunables that a particular tuner is, is, is working with. And then if we detect any outside activity on those, we disable auto tuning in the relevant domain. So there's no kind of crosstalk between what BPF tune does and what an administrator is trying to achieve. We also don't want to replace tunables with more tunables. So 
we're trying to eliminate some of the complexity associated with all the kernel tree tunables. But of course, the danger is that we add a whole new set of tunables within BPF tune and give people all sorts of options um, there. So the aim is really to make BPF tune zero config and the tuning decisions we make should be sort of largely informed by observations we make about the system as opposed to choices that somebody makes on the command line when they run BPF tune. So the aim is to really have no options to go over the tuning process. It's also key to be namespace aware. Um, tunable values in one namespace might not make sense in another. So um, tuning should be done on a per namespace basis where you know the tunable in question is namespace, not all of them are. A key design principle as well is really when we're actually trying to find the right answer for a tunable, we want to take a sort of machine learning approach and make small changes incrementally and then evaluate the effects of those changes. Um, so this allows us to sort of examine the relationship between the constraints um, relevant to a particular achievable. We want to make small changes and observe the effects. So for example, for TCP buffer sizing, if we approach one of the buffer limits, we, we, we tend to increase. So that's a push upwards for the value. But we also want to monitor for any of the negative effects that might be associated with that, because in that case, we want to undo that change. So if we see latency in the form of increased round trip times in TCP, and specifically, if that's correlated with our increases in buffer size, um, we want to pull the value back down for, for the, the send receive buffer size. Similarly, we don't want to result in memory exhaustion. So if we keep increasing those limits, obviously, if each socket has a lot of memory associated, then we can, we can hit some of the you know, TCP low memory conditions like memory pressure, memory exhaustion. So we want to monitor for those and pull back down in a, cons in a consequence of hitting those. So it's sort of a balancing act between constraints which might push up a value like hitting a limit and other constraints that might mitigate um might make that not a good idea so things like running short of memory or inducing latency would be the kind of things that should pull values back down again so here in, in quite small text is um, an example of just starting vpf tune as a service we can then look in the syslog output to see what it did in this case i was just going around normal development activity cloning git repositories that sort of thing um, we can see what happened. Um, in one case, we hit a 1% uh, uh, loss rate for a connection and we applied the BBR congestion control algorithm. The rationale there is essentially that BBR is less pessimistic about um, the kind of um, congestion limits that should be applied in, in, in the face of loss. Um, and then secondly, we saw an, uh, an increase in the TCP received memory buffer size. Um, we hit some of the limits, so we approached some of the limits there, and we we bumped up that value as well. So finally, I just wanted to talk about the work in progress in BPF Tune. So BPF Tune is new and it's under open development. We we put it out in GitHub as soon as it was even vaguely ready because we really wanted to make sure that we could incorporate user feedback and you know get other people's perspectives. As I say, we focused on some of the initial problems we ran into in Oracle, but we're very interested to see what other tuning issues people have and, and, and we're hoping to apply some suggestions from from other folks as well um and it, you know it's very much under open development so if you have any suggestions please do file issues or there's a feature plan which we keep updated regularly to describe the work we've done the work we're planning um feel free to to, to post um changes to that if that's if that's the way you want to communicate those also um one of the recent changes we've made is to support multiple strategies for a tuner so some of the tuning methods now are quite basic but the aim is to sort of evolve them over time and if we have multiple strategies for a specific domain the idea is if we have metrics that can evaluate the success of those various strategies we can switch between them as appropriate so essentially if one strategy is not working we switch to another one so the basic strategy support is in bpf tune now we haven't made much use of it yet but there's work ongoing to do that um, specifically, we're looking at using reinforcement learning for optimizing TCP service settings. Reinforcement learning is a very promising area to apply to BPF because in terms of requirements, BPF has a lot of the things that reinforcement learning needs. Reinforcement learning doesn't require huge amounts of memory. It's not complex. It's essentially about choosing the right actions based on reward signals. And there's ways to formalize things like TCP connection lifetime in that kind of context. And, and we're, we're sort of doing some work around that at the moment to see if that's an effective way to do things like choose the optimal congestion control algorithm and make other TCP per connection settings uh, based on what reward signals that we define. So as I mentioned before, the initial focus of BBF Tune was on networking related tunables, but we're, we're keen to expand the scope to other subsystems as well.
And by making BPFG unpluggable, that, that's a reasonably straightforward thing to do. From an upstream kernel perspective, having more trace points um, makes life easier for BPF tune because we end up having stable places to attach and, and, and gather information. One particular area this might be useful in the future would be the neighbor and root table garbage collection um, to have trace points around completion there so we can assess how effective they were and maybe tweak some tunables if necessary. From a more general perspective, having a way to attach to the same decision points that are sort of tied to tunables today would be useful in the future. So rather than the sys control value being what determines the behavior, we have a BPF program attached to that decision point in lieu of having use it just using a simple tunable value. So we can make life more programmatic in the, in the way that BPF does. So this could be easily done with an FMOD return BPF program where we just have a dummy function which um, we can modify the return value of in BPF context. And that modified return value could take the place of the tunable value so we can make things more dynamic rather than have just the tunables set of static tunables govern things i mean currently bpf tune has to sit in user space and modify a lot of tunable values whereas if we had an internal method to do that that might be a more natural way to express some of some of these auto tuning decisions um one thing that would be key i think in that context though would be to communicate to administrators that the tunable is under map under programmatic control via bpf um, because obviously, if people are setting tunable values, they expect them to be in effect. And if we're overriding that, we want to make that clear somehow. So th that's pretty much all I had to say. So thanks for your time. Um, I encourage you to take a look at um, the BPF tune repository, um, file issues, kick the tires, let, let us know if, um, how you find it, if there's other future work that you think we should address. Um, you know, we're, we're very keen to, to, to move forward with it. It's early days. So suggestions now will be, will be really helpful moving forward. So. Thanks again for your time. And thank you for your time, Alan. That was a tremendous talk on BPF tune, auto tuning in Linux with eBPF. This is our next talk is going to be brought to us by Dave Thaler and Alan Joet of Microsoft. Dave is a great friend to the project, and I'm really looking forward to what he has to say about using eBPF to create native Windows drivers. Welcome to today's talk on using eBPF to create Windows drivers. My name is Alan Jarrett, and I work as a developer at Microsoft on eBPF for Windows. Dave Thaler, an architect at Microsoft, generously assisted in preparing this presentation. To start off, let's cover the reason why using BPF to generate Windows drivers is important. In today's evolving threat environment, technologies like hypervisor protected code integrity, as well as similar technologies on Linux, have been developed to enhance the protection of modern operating systems. As both technologies work in a similar fashion, this presentation will primarily cover Microsoft's HVCI, but I will highlight any differences specific to each platform. At their core, both technologies ensure that only signed code pages can execute in the kernel, making it significantly more challenging to inject malware into the kernel and facilitating a clear understanding of the system's running components. A quick overview of how hypervisor enforced code integrity works. When code is loaded into the kernel, it is initially marked as read-only without the execute flag, essentially just data. The kernel then asks the memory manager to mark these code pages as executable and to perform relocations, which triggers a call to the secure kernel running in VTL1. The secure kernel then verifies the signature, including the signing authority, performs the relocations, and marks the code pages as executable. At this point, the code can be executed in kernel. If we then examine the JIT workflow in this light, 
we can begin to see the problem. BPF bytecode is first loaded into the kernel, where it is converted into native machine code by the verifier and JIT compiler. At this point, the kernel needs to mark these pages as executable, but code pages generated by the JIT compiler lack any form of signature and cannot simply be signed as the signing keys are kept offline. While it is possible to move verification and JIT into the hypervisor, this is not an ideal solution, as one of the goals of the secure kernel is to reduce the amount of code that needs to be trusted, and the verifier and JIT compiler tend to be large blocks of code. The solution that was adopted on Windows is to move the process of verification and signing of the, off the machine and into a trusted environment. The initial steps of the workflow remain the same, with BPF programs being written in C or another high-level language, followed by being compiled into an ELF file containing bytecode. The bytecode is then verified and the bytecode is translated into C, with each BPF instruction generating a corresponding C code. This transformation maintains the constraints that the verifier checked, ensuring that the generated C code is still verified. The generated C code is then compiled and linked into a Windows driver using the standard Windows compiler toolchain, thereby gaining the full suite of security features like control flow guard and speculative execution protection. In addition, the C compiler can then further optimize the code potentially even using profile-guided optimization. Finally, the resultant driver is signed just like any other Windows driver. Debugging BPF programs has always been a challenge. One of the traditional tools for debugging is via the use of BPF print K calls, which while useful, isn't ideal as one cannot simply place breakpoints or examine call stacks. The process of converting BPF programs to Windows drivers adds an opportunity to make debugging easier. If the original BPF program contains BPF type format data, aka BTF, then this data is translated during conversion process and can be used by the debugger to allow placing breakpoints in BPF programs. Likewise, all the BPF register state can also be examined in the debugger and the BPF program can be stepped over instruction by instruction if needed. An area for future improvement is to parse the dwarf debug data and maintain the mapping from register to BPF variables. In this demo, we can see a developer compiling a simple connection tracking program into a BPF program. The developer can then use this toolchain to convert the BPF's ELF file into a native Windows driver. The developer can then load the BPF program into the kernel. Finally, the developer can then step through the code in a live kernel debugger. This demo shows how to build a BPF program, then convert it to a native Windows driver, and finally debug it. The first step is to compile the BPF program using Clang, the same way it is done on Linux today. Next, the BPF program is run through the toolchain to convert from an ELF file to a native Windows driver. This system is set for test signing mode and the toolchain signs the driver using a test signing certificate by default. Finally, to test the new driver, we first install the eBPF runtime onto this machine. At this point, we can load the eBPF program. As we can see, the connection tracker program has been loaded and attached to the SockOps attach point. We can then switch to the debugger, break in, set a breakpoint on our connection tracking function. As you can see, it's almost immediately hit due to traffic on the machine. 
we can then step through the code line by line and observe the state of the BPF registers. There are several possibilities we are exploring as potential future directions for this project. The first is to offer native image generation as a service, where the developer could potentially submit a BPF program, have it verified and compiled, then download a signed Windows driver. The second is to potentially port this to Linux, where instead of generating signed Windows drivers, it could emit signed Linux kernel modules if desired. The third is to improve the ability to debug BPF programs by adding support for debug information not currently present in BTF, but present in Dwarf, and to use this to provide register to BPF variable mappings. Finally, there needs to be a solution for dynamic code generation scenarios like BPF trace where there isn't a signature to be checked. In conclusion, hypervisor code integrity is already available in Windows and has been proposed for Linux. Similarly, BPF continues to grow in popularity, both on Linux and Windows, but this poses a conflict as JIT and HVCI are fundamentally incompatible. The solution outlined here is to move to offline verification and signing of BPF programs, which offers several benefits beyond simply making it work with HVCI. Thank you for attending today's presentation. If you want to know more about this project, please visit our GitHub project page at github.com slash Microsoft slash eBPF for Windows. Thank you, Alan. That was a tremendous presentation and really awesome to see all of the work making EPF even more portable, not only just in Linux, but also in Windows. Great stuff. The next one, the next talk we have up is our final keynote by Joe Stringer, who is coming to us live from the Hive. He will be joining us after this talk for a live Q&A. Um, building the, so building the kernel of tomorrow with EBPF. Welcome, Joe. I'm Joe Stringer. I'm a principal architect at Isovalent, a Cilium co-maintainer, and a member of the eBPF Foundation's eBPF Steering Committee. It's my pleasure to round out the day with this keynote around building the kernel of tomorrow with eBPF. Firstly, I'm inspired by this community and how it's grown. I'm inspired by how individuals like you are driving the future of how operating systems solve real world problems. The reason we're drawn towards eBPF is because eBPF allows us to build the best possible solutions to the problems that we face. Through this talk, I hope to inspire you about how we can leverage the power of eBPF to build application-specific kernels. Over the course of this talk, let's take a look at how the kernel is moving away from larger opinionated APIs towards reusable concepts and primitives. I wanna take a look at how we can navigate the line between stability and flexibility as we tailor the kernel to our application specific use case. And finally, I want to apply this to the real world by talking about how Cilium builds a cloud native OS layer. Innovation is at the heart of the eBPF community. So how do we ensure that eBPF continues to be an engine for innovation? First, let's recap the difficulties with the traditional kernel development process. Historically, it's been hard to change and extend the kernel to, to specific use cases. Additionally, it was difficult to deploy and experiment with new functionality and observe those solutions in real environments. There was a bit of a tension in the API trade-offs as well for tailing the kernel to specific tasks that we face versus its role as a general purpose operating system. 
One early approach that was commonly used in Linux was to build opinionated models around solving particular problem spaces. Just in networking, we can look at several different subsystems that all provide abilities to route and filter and mangle packets. This has been a source of ongoing debate as use cases grow and overlap and converge between these subsystems. eBPF redefines where the API boundary is by providing tools to tailor the kernel. Broadly, this is, consists of lower level primitives with well-defined constraints systems. eBPF redefines where the API boundary is by providing tools to tailor the kernel. Broadly, this is, consists of lower level primitives with well-defined constraints. And with eBPF, we can express the same higher level models by injecting programs and maps into the kernel at runtime. But at the same time, we're not locked into those models over time. Updating them is easier because it's all distributed with a user space application. So eBPF provides a strong base model to then innovate on top of. Innovation can't occur in a vacuum. Innovation requires that strong platform for people to build on top of. What we're seeing now is efforts to stabilize the fundamentals of the eBPF model. People are looking for an eBPF-like experience on other platforms, whether they be non-Linux OSs or hardware devices. Earlier this year, the IETF established a working group with prominent members of the eBPF community, which will focus on standardizing a lot of the core eBPF model. But this raises a question, will we standardize all of eBPF under the IETF? The challenge here is that there's a spectrum between the stability of a system and the flexibility of that system. While the stability provides a strong basis for innovation, if we commit to stable APIs too early, that can potentially limit what we can do in future. The way that we can solve this is by building up strong primitives that are supported by multiple different use cases. There are various ongoing efforts to extend libraries, compilers, and languages to support more flexible representations of eBPF programs. And we're also consolidating some of the core eBPF APIs in the kernel around concepts like BPF links. BPF links allow convenient management of the lifecycle and detachment of programs and allow multiple programs to be attached directly through kernel APIs. But with all of this, there's also needs for general mechanisms that will automatically adapt to the kernel as it evolves. This is an active area of development that we'll continue to talk about. So the question is, how do we protect the flexibility of eBPF over time? Let's look at how the kernel can adapt to the use cases of the future, even the ones that we don't yet know about. As new use cases arise, we want to tailor the kernel to those patterns. Even the smartest person in the room can't predict the future. While the barriers to kernel contribution had previously been high, which encourages committing to API models earlier than we'd like, eBPF in general provides tools for us to be able to better deploy and iterate on those models. But there's always more to do. The biggest example of some of the recent changes is the rise of kfunks and kpointers in the last couple of years. This makes it easier than ever to expose kernel functionality to eBPF. While mo uh, with modern eBPF built on these newer primitives, there's a much tighter binding between the user application and the kernel code even if that kernel code is defined in eBPF. The eBPF maintainers have been putting a lot of thought into how to retain the flexibility in that approach. But the result is that we have a future where we can tailor kernels to become application specific. So let's look at some models for this. So as I talked about, the application is more tightly bound to the behavior of the kernel with these newer models. There are various different concepts that have arisen in recent times in which the kernel ideally would adapt to. If we look at this sort of question, where in the kernel is the current Kubernetes pod? Where is the Docker container? Where is the virtual network? While these concepts that have recently arisen may be backed by kernel functionality, there is no first party notion of these concepts in kernel APIs. An interesting possibility here is that we can potentially inject these new concepts into the kernel at runtime with eBPF. This way, we can learn more about how those concepts fit the underlying architecture and real-world environments, and we can choose when we want to commit to those stable APIs. 
With this model, there's a range of different use cases, but it's particularly well suited to modifying kernel control logic, such as routing or enforcement of a policy. This does raise the question though, how do users combine multiple eBPF kernel extensions on the same host? There are multiple layers, as I mentioned, with BPF links, but there's also user space solutions to this problem. Let's take a look at some of the user space models for this. There are various different daemons out there, such as Leaf and BPFD, that allow you to load and run your eBPF programs, and potentially their user space companions, to modify the kernel fun functionality. This has the potential to simplify and streamline eBPF deployments into an environment. Some of the desirable properties with this model is that it can determine canonical ordering between eBPF programs when you're loading multiple of them. At the same time, it expects stronger API boundaries between those eBPF programs to provide correct behavior. This often pairs with looser coordination with the companion programs. I look forward to seeing how the APIs of these applications are developed to balance the spectrum of stability and flexibility for future innovation. Another goal that these daemons may address is how to guarantee the authenticity of eBPF programs. The idea here is how would we cryptographically verify that the right code is running, even in an environment with malicious actors? There's a trade-off here depending on the sorts of models that are used to deploy eBPF programs. If the eBPF programs themselves are relatively static, then one proposed model is to sign those eBPF programs out of box in some secure environment and then validate their authenticity when loading into the kernel. There are also applications like BPF trace that dynamically generate code at runtime. A proposal to try to handle this case is by signing the applications themselves and then leveraging read-only file systems with authentication primitives to prove that only these programs can modify the kernel, even if you have root access. This topic is under active discussion and may have real repercussions on future flexibility of eBPF, so I'd encourage you to participate in them. But let's move on to how Cilium leverages the concept of tailoring the kernel to specific applications in cloud-native environments. Cilium aims to provide a modern cloud-native networking layer that provides that solves problems around networking, security, and observability. Since the beginning of Cilium, we've had the strong desire to challenge the status quo. And a common refrain is, if we could start completely fresh today, while knowing what the demands are of cloud environments, how would we design a networking system to solve those problems? How can we tailor the kernel to our special purpose application? Let's talk about that application. This won't be a comprehensive list, but it should give you a good sample of how eBPF can help us to solve problems of today in new ways. Some of the new changes with uh, cloud native environments is increasing scale. We're talking about tens of thousands of applications interconnected across clusters. This drives the need for performance and efficiency. With that scale comes churn as the applications come and go. Network policy must follow those apps as they migrate throughout the cloud. And furthermore, it's important to be able to operate these clusters. This is both in terms of how we mitigate problems as they arise and how we debug problems when they do occur. So when building an application-specific kernel for this use case, we were able to discover some unexpected solutions by looking at problem spaces holistically. Let's consider a web application that's trying to reach out to a peer over the network. For every connection that that connection is, uh, application establishes, there are many messages that it may send, and each of those messages may be broken up into many packets. So if you perform load balancing operations for every single packet transmit, the CPU time starts to add up. Some approaches to solving load balancing have been to move the load balancing into the applications themselves using client libraries. But with that model, every single app needs to be individually updated to depend on that library. Historically, it's been difficult to modify the socket or TCP layers. So the natural place to solve this load balancing problem historically has been at the packet layer. Through eBPF, we were able to modify the kernel functionality at the socket layer, allowing us to reduce the number of load balancing operations to once per connection instead of once per packet. This allows us to achieve orders of magnitude faster load balancing operations. So we can find a sweet spot for how to solve problems like this with eBPF. 
Another use, interesting use case is how we propagate the knowledge of pod identity. Kubernetes has this notion about how each deployment has a corresponding name, namespace, and labels. And traditionally, solutions that would implement uh, policy for these uh, use cases are not able to propagate all of that information down into the kernel. The identity is lost when crossing the user space kernel boundary. So the representation at the kernel and network layer is different from the representation at the higher layers of the stack. This can make it more difficult to handle the high churn of a cloud environment and more difficult to debug when something goes wrong. With eBPF, we can inject that identity knowledge directly into the kernel at runtime with custom eBPF logic. And led down the road, if we want to extend the notion of that identity, we have the freedom to dynamically update that too. What's neat about this approach is that we can propagate the same identity of the application all the way from the control plane down to individual nodes to attach to the application, into the kernel via eBPF, and even into the packets. This is enabled by things like in Kubernetes, we have strong flexibility through custom resource definitions and enabled by eBPF in the kernel. In this model, Cilium manages the identity associations for these applications at runtime. And this cuts down the effort required to be able to correlate the identity of that application to the traffic that's generated by it, as this identity is present at every layer of the stack. Let's take a look at how this impacts cluster operations as we observe what's happening in the network. With the identity bound so tightly to the application, we can build observability tools that help us to more easily reason about how traffic is flowing through the cluster. The same data path that's implementing control logic to route those traffic and apply enforcement can also emit events with cloud native metadata built directly into them. From an observability perspective, we can also tailor how much information is emitted rather than being forced to either emit data for every system event that occurs or only aggregate. This allows us to shine a light on the areas that we need more information from without overlo overloading operations tooling. Well, I'd love to spend more time digging into the details of how eBPF allows us to tailor the kernel for these cloud native use cases. I don't have forever. So let me just leave you with this. So we've been working on a range of really interesting use cases in the Cilium community for the last several years, from sock maps to gracefully terminating remote connections on other nodes to file integrity monitor. These are mostly listed in order of older to newer. So if you're interested in any particular item here, there are often blogs or presentations out there that you can find about these topics. Several of these are also under active development. So reach out if they're relevant to your use case. If you're curious to learn more, Isovalent hosts a range of labs to explore some of the capabilities of Cilium and Tetragon. And hang around with us in Slack after the summit and in the coming days. There's so many ideas we've heard throughout the day and would love to continue the discussions. Of course, there's ebpf.io with a range of resources on there for getting started with ebpf as well. So with that, I will thank you for spending time with us today. I hope you're inspired about how you can use ebpf to build the kernel of tomorrow. So hi, Joe, and thank you so much for putting that talk together and for now joining us for some live Q&A. Yeah, nice thanks for having me. Behind you as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Even All from right. the heart. <laughs> there were quite a few people asking about how they could get involved or, or the IETF uh, standardization effort, and uh, that's open to everyone, right? Yeah, so yeah, the, the IETF uh, BPF working group is, is open to any, uh, anyone. There's a, uh, a mailing list that you can join and, and post uh, messages and coordinate with the other members of the work, working group. Uh, and they also meet uh, at the IETF meetings on a, on a regular basis. I think they meet maybe three or four times a year. It's great to see it coming together. And we have this interesting question from Lewis about the IETF standardization. Do you see the compile once run everywhere fitting into that conversation? Yeah, so compile once running everywhere is kind of an interesting aspect of this uh, because 
it's sort of interacting with the the loader and how the the kind of expectations on the on the loader uh, play out. Um, so it's not necessarily directly involved with the the instruction set. Um, but there is a, a particular topic in the IETF working group around informational RFC, uh, RFCs uh, to try and communicate things like guidelines um, around how uh, you can make portable applications, um, EPF applications. So um, I think it would probably fit into that sort of area. Yeah. That's super interesting. Another comment that came up is asking about this idea of OS extensibility. There have been lots of different approaches considered for decades. Um, exokernel, spin, I also thought of unikernels. What it is, is it about eBPF that makes that more attractive approach? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we've got a bit of a, a pendulum going uh, kind of, you know, sometimes it seems like something more monolithic looks like the right solution. And sometimes it looks like unikernels is going to be the future. Um, and I think it is a spectrum. And, and I think what BPF is, is providing is something that's closer to that sort of unikernel approach, but not going all the way. Um, and so you can still kind of benefit from some of the, the more shared uh, resource management stuff that you would get from a, um, uh, something that's not as uh, hyper application specific. Yeah, I, I remember some time ago, somebody saying, oh, you know, maybe the whole kernel is going to be rewritten as eBPF programs. And somebody else said, don't say that to, to like kernel developers. <laughs> I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> I mean, the, the one, uh, the one uh, guarantee is that things will continue to change. <laughs> That's really true. Definitely. Uh, I'm going to show one last uh, kind of comment rather than a question. But uh, Jesse has said, I'd love to see something like the concept of CRD CRDs like we have in Kubernetes, but for eBPF. So the ability to expose data in the output of an IP command. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I think that's a really insightful kind of statement. Um, and, and I think if we look at what BTF is trying to do around modeling what fields look like within the kernel, uh, but also from uh, BPF applications themselves, um, I think we're starting to get the towards this sort of an idea. Um, we do still have the, the balance between the, the flexibility of what is available, because if we're building tooling around this, then uh, we need to know that those fields are, are, are stable. Um, but at the same time, there, there may be ways to expose those at, you know, from the kernel to say, hey, these are the fields that are available and then tie them into certain resources as you uh, dump from, you know, just kind of standardized tooling. Yeah, that's a really interesting point that maybe being able to leverage that BTF could, could help. Wonderful. So I think that's just about all we have time for. I think there are going to be some more comments and discussion in Slack. So if you, I think you just got off a plane. So if you still have the uh, the, the strength and the energy to do so, that I think there'll be lots yeah. of people happy to hear from you in Slack. So with that, let's uh, let's bring Duffy back. And uh, I mean, that was the last talk of the day. And what a wonderful way to end this amazing event. I feel like that was a really good contrast to what Gene was saying about improving the developer experience as well. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Experience yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, I, I do think it's, you know, I, I like Joe's point about one thing, this, one thing for sure is that it will continue to change. You know, like even in this, this last year, we've seen just a ton of change in like the number of EVPF help, helpers, a lot of the changes that are happening in, um, in the kernel. It's just, it's been tremendous to watch uh, so much change in the, in, in what's available. Which is a lot of this work has been done by people who are probably watching right now. So uh, yeah. thank you to everyone who's who's involved in this community. <laughs> we have a couple more things to cover before we let everyone go today. So the first is let's have a quick recap about the uh, capture the flag. So I think quite a few of you have been having a go at that during the day. We have a little leaderboard. So I don't know if it was uh, obvious wow. to people, but in the code that you got out of the capture the flag, it told us how long it took to solve the problem. So now I'm thinking Ignacio doing it in 11 seconds. I, I'm wondering that, how. <laughs> like, <laughs> there has to be at least a little bit of luck mixed in there. That's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty amazing time. Yeah, I also see Mauricio heading up the leaderboard on hard mode. And I'm wondering if he used Inspector Gadget. So that will be a, a good question right. to ask. And um, we're going to explore all of this on Friday with Dan. Uh, we'll walk through the Capture the Flag competition. Um, if you want to join us for that Echo on Friday, perhaps the best way to get notified is just hit subscribe if you're watching YouTube. And you will automatically hear about that Echo session on Friday. 
Yeah, and if you're if you're subscribed to us on um, Twitter or you know in other places or an X, I guess it's called now, you'll actually we actually announce them every week. And so if you're watching if you're watching the feed there, you'll be able to also be notified that it's coming up. And you can also get reminders about online EBPF events by joining our new EBPF virtual uh, meetup group. We'll keep you posted about all sorts of online events that you won't want to miss that are related to this amazing technology. And I think, you know, we all agree that this is a fascinating technology. The story yeah. behind how it came about is also fascinating. So this is a bit that uh, we promised you at the start of today's event. We wanted to share something pretty special with you. So let's show a little preview of something that our friends over at Speakeasy Productions have been working on. Twenty eleven was exciting. We were all trying to solve this same problem, which is how do you move packets around in a data center? SDN by then had already become quite mature in terms of standard virtualization. However, there was not really this flexibility of programmability. And at that point, like something clicked, I figured, well, I will just invent my own instruction set. What Alexi did, it's this crazy idea. We're going to put a virtual machine in the kernel. He was trying to kill like a thousand birds with one stone. It turns out that that concept is much more general than just networking. It actually creates this ability to truly extend the kernel in ways that researchers have been trying to figure out forever. All of a sudden, you can have an idea and you can get that into the hand of an end user running in the kernel within days. This means we can rebuild everything better. What should we rebuild first? For Facebook, we showed BPF running in the data center with a line rate speed, processing 15 million packets per second, where BPF's program spends literally like 15 nanoseconds to process a packet. Then people realized that yes, BPF is truly fast. At that point, we could see that it was exploding. It's grown from a big project to a really big project. It's not an evolution, it's a revolution. This is gonna not only change what we were working on right now, but it will also change the industry forever. It's so amazing to see so many just incredible people involved in that video talking about like, you know, EBPF changing the world forever. I'm really looking forward to seeing the full documentary and it's going to be launched at KubeCon in Chicago in October and it'll also be viewable online. And of course, we will be posting in EBPF Slack when that documentary is released. But if you would like us to email you, you can use the registration form for the summit. It's still available on the website to make sure that we have your email address. And we'll also be sending out to everybody who registered to let you know when all the videos and the slides from today are uploaded so that you can watch them again at your leisure. And thank you all for joining us today. There have been you know, anywhere from three to 500 of you watching us live throughout this entire event. I really do appreciate you being here. And also, thank you to all of our speakers for putting in all of the work to actually get these talks out and you know, being able to really share your knowledge and your experience with everyone who has been able to attend now or in the future. And thank you so much for everybody who's been putting comments into Slack. There's been some really great questions and conversations. I think lots of people have come away with new things to think about. I think we've all learned a lot. Um, I really also want to thank the many people from the ISO Valent team who've worked so hard to put this event together particularly want to shout out to Ella, Cornelia, Bill, and Dan, who've done a ton of work behind the scenes to bring this event to life. For sure. Thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye.